Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Schools across Britain could be facing months of closures due to fears over a concrete collapse. Good morning, it's six o'clock on Monday the 4th of September. This is Breakfast on GB News with Eamon and Ellie. Here's what's leading the news this morning. Students across the country are set to return to class this week and the government is now under pressure to reveal the exact number of schools at risk of collapse. This is Jeremy Hunt says the government will spend what it takes to make schools safe from crumbling concrete. We'll be putting that to the test this morning. Elsewhere, as Parliament returns from a six-week recess, the Prime Minister has been warned that it's make or break on small boats, as the Home Office recorded the highest daily number of crossings in the Channel so far this year. Meanwhile, Sir Keir Starmer says there will be no income tax rises if Labour wins power. The Labour leader vowed to kick the economy out of the doom loop of low growth and high taxes. And Manchester United forward Jadon Sancho says he's been a scapegoat for a long time after being dropped by Eric Ten Hag in a 3-1 loss to Arsenal. Paul Coit will be here with all the sport. I will. That's the elephant in the room at the moment today. Manchester United lose. I'm not laughing to Manchester to Arsenal. It was a bit of a disaster at the end of the game. Max Verstappen wins again. And Jack Draper, who's our final hope in the US Open place today. Ten in a row then for Verstappen. Ten in a row. Probably yeah. the 11 and then 12 and then 13. I think very brave of Jadon Sancho to stand up against his manager. That may not end well. God, dear. I, honestly, you, you, you think, well, where is that going to go? Is he going to back down and go, oh, yeah, it's okay, Jade. No, it's not going to end well at all, is it? But look, Alanga, uh, we sold him to Nottingham Forest and he scored on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe that's a ploy. Maybe it is. Make Maybe it is. Work. Thank you, Paul. The forecast? Yeah, with Jonathan Bauntree. That's also coming up. Temperatures are on the rise this week and we could reach 30 degrees Celsius for the first time since the start of July. Join me later for all the weather details. Uh, the top story on this Monday morning, the Chancellor says there will be no extra money for schools affected by the crumbling concrete crisis with repair costs coming from the existing education budget. Yes, Jeremy Hunt's comments come amid a growing demand for ministers to release the full list of buildings affected. Parents are being left in the dark as millions of pupils return to school this week. OK, from the opposition, uh, the shadow education minister, Bridget Phillipson, says Labour will force a vote this week if the government does not pub pub publish even. <laughs> I should have gone back to school. Uh, this information. We can't be confident that we know the full picture because ministers are refusing to publish the full list of school affected, affected. It's a scandal that parents are being left in the dark just at the point of the new school term starting. Ministers need to be upfront, publish that list and get a grip. We think it's vital that the government publishes the full list of schools affected. They need to get a grip of this situation. But if they refuse to do so, we'll force a vote in the House of Commons this week and make it happen so that parents aren't left in the dark. Well, uh, let's speak to education journalist, co-founder of Teacher Tap, Laura McInerney, uh, with this one this morning. Laura, 
you know, where do we begin with this? Let's go to the Chancellor first of all. I see one headline uh, Express leads today with Hunt vows. We'll spend what it takes to fix unsafe schools. Then we hear it has to come from existing budgets, budgets that pay for classroom assistance, budgets that pay for equipment, budgets that pay for goodness knows what, but they weren't designed to pay for crumbling buildings. No, and also those budgets have been cut a lot in the past 13 years. I mean, the spend on capital, so that's the buildings themselves across the school estate, is about 50% lower over the past 13 years. And heads have repeatedly said that the more that you cut our budgets, the less likely we are to be able to maintain our ceilings, our walls, and now those are the exact parts of the buildings which they're starting to worry about. How have we got to this point, Laura? I mean, we've known about this crumbling concrete. There's been warnings about it, but over 30 years. How has it come to the end of this six-week holiday and parents still aren't sure if the school that they're sending their children to is, in a, is a safe building? I mean, I think there's a long-term and a short-term answer to that. The long-term answer is that in the mid-90s, it was clear that there was going to be about 14,000 schools in this position. And so the Labour government in the late 90s and the 2000s spent a lot of money. It had this huge list of schools, and it was essentially going through and rebuilding them one after the other. In 2010, David Cameron, then the Prime Minister, decided that what he was going to do was stop that programme and severely limit it. And of course, the plan was auster austerity would mean that by now there'd be lots more money. Unfortunately, there isn't any money and the roofs are caving in and so this is the situation we find ourselves in. Why it's taken until now, um, I'm not entirely clear and I don't think we'll find out for a little while but I suspect that there has been new information over the summer or more alarming information which means that they want to raise the concern levels on these particular 150 schools for now and, and no one wants to be in the position of course where they would have to sit on television and explain why this has happened so I think they are being cautious um, and that's a very good thing, it's just a shame it's come so late. There's a few of them that are going to be on television today, Laura, having to explain that, uh, that very thing, and none of it seems to ring true. They did know about it, and they chose not to investigate it and spend on it, and now they're pretending that children's safety is priority. That's right. Um... And, and I, I think it's I think it's a shame that we're in a situation where the chancellor um, is pretending that there is going to be extra cash for this when there isn't. I mean, I think it's one thing to be honest in a dreadful situation we shouldn't be in. But I think to be dishonest or at least misleading at best in these situations is really going to upset the teachers. And bear in mind, this isn't just as well about the concrete in this particular circumstance. We know from TeachTap, we survey 10,000 teachers each day, around 40 percent of schools say that they've got a book it's somewhere in their school because there's a leak in roof. It's also about the fact that we think 12% of teachers are saying there's at least one room in their school they already can't use because of the lack of maintenance. And um, safety is the number one concern. That's the absolute worst part of this and has to be dealt with first. But also, who wants to be sending their children to schools where there are leaking roofs? This is something that does need investment. Investment for the long term because it's investment in children's futures. And that's what we hear teachers saying constantly. Well, this is the issue, isn't it? And it is a much wider one than just the concrete. I mean, in some of the papers this morning, um, it's remarking that official figures from the Department of Education in 2019 says asbestos is present in England schools, mm -hmm. four out of five schools. So it just makes you think, doesn't it? If you're looking at the concrete, if that work's being done, well, we could have a real big asbestos issue as well. This could take months to fix. That's right. And there are claims every year for compensation on, um, on schools because of the fact that there are people who end up with mesothelioma, which is the cancer related to asbestos in schools, because they happen to be somewhere where it gets disturbed, whether that's a kid kicking a football into one of the ceiling panels and then the next thing you know, it falls down. Um, this is something we reported on when I was the editor of Schools Week back in 2016, 2017. And as you say, we're now many years further forwards. Of course, there's been a pandemic in the middle, but we can't get away from the fact that there are are some big issues with school buildings that have been going for some time and had we continued that program of rebuilding there would be fewer of them not saying there wouldn't be any but there'd be fewer and unfortunately now we're in a circumstance where this is going to have to be dealt with quickly which means it's going to be more expensive 
and there's less cash in the bank than it was in the past. So for me, this is going to end up a bit like the cladding scandal, where there's going to be lots of finger pointing, the local authorities, the schools themselves, the government, and everyone is going to have to work together very quickly to figure out how this cash is going to be put in, because the school's budgets are not in a space where they're able to cover this, despite what the Chancellor is saying. Absolutely, Laura. Absolutely. The country's broke. There's nothing in the cupboard, nothing anywhere. There's nothing for the, for the doctors, the nurses, the uh, train drivers. The, we could go on and on and on. There's nothing for anybody, least of all schools. But there is a massive foreign aid budget. Surely we've got to get to a stage where someone says, look after your own first. I think there's always complicated issues around this. And one of the things with the foreign aid is that in the end, if we don't spend money on foreign aid, then you actually end up having to intervene again later down the line. So you'll often see a bit like with the school building issue, you know, it's very easy to say, let's cut that now. But in 10 years time, if we don't have investment in foreign countries or there hasn't been support and help, you can end up with worse situations in those countries 10 years down the line that ends up costing the country even more. I do think what would be good is if we had on both sides of the political agenda, people trying to work out where we um, where we could do in innovative things. Now, there's a lot of criticism for it. And in the past, perhaps it wasn't done perfectly. But in the late 90s, Gordon Brown did look at the private finance initiatives for schools. That was a way of getting businesses to help fund school buildings. Um, they weren't perfectly set up and there have been some issues, but there's got to be more innovative ways. What we don't really hear at the moment is politicians coming up with new ideas. It's often very, very basic. Um, they're just saying they're not going to do anything or we're trying to cut and pinch around the side. We've got to think about how we raise more cash. Laura, got to leave it there. Really appreciate your, your take on things. And as I say, we've got a number of interviews which I think will reflect the sort of things that you've had to say today. Laura McInerney is the co-founder of Teacher Tap and she is an education journalist. Appreciate your take, Laura. Mm. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Thank you. Um, it's just a mess, isn't it? We're talking about a mess. When you were at school, was there ever anybody smelly in your class? Yeah, there was actually, come to think of it, yes. yes. Why? <laughs> now, we used to give them all sorts of horrible nicknames oh, and everything. Oh, no, like yes, what? Which I'm not going to repeat now. <laughs> but more pupils are likely to arrive at the new term uh, being dirty, dirty clothes, mm -hmm. unbrushed teeth, leaving them isolated and depressed. This is teachers reporting on this. They say 72%, that's nearly three quarters of staff, believe there has been an increase in hygiene poverty. Oh. Uh, in their schools over the past year. Of 500 school workers who said they were aware of pupils affected by the issue, 71% expect the problem to have become worse and smellier as the academic year begins. So things like people who never watch, wash their PE kits, oh. you know, so they go and they play in the rain and things and then they roll them up in a ball, they play on a Monday and then they take them out on a Thursday to play them again and they're covered in fungus and things like that. But the amount of pupils who don't wash their hair, don't brush their teeth, don't deal with all sorts of I things. I think that's really sad. I think it is sad. People can't afford to, to wash clothing or give their kids a wash. But is that what it is? Is it affordability? Well, is it affordability? As my mother used to say, regret. soap and water costs not costs very little. And I was going to say that, um, you know, can people not smell urine or worse? Yeah. You know, in their homes. I mean, what 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 what, what is going on? Why why are our kids getting dirtier, filthier, and smellier at school? So poor pupil hygiene is set to get worse in the year ahead. And I would have thought young people today themselves are a bit more aware of their own hygiene yeah. than they were in my day. Well, you'd think. We had a Such very a smelly on class. Image, isn't there? Particularly in Did primary you have school. Very smelly class. Yes. Oh. And the teacher used to have a we had a fire in our um, a fire like a burning fire uh, that you warmed yourself stove, up. Yeah. Stove that uh, they used to have a, a rack uh, with underpants drying on them oh, constantly. Yeah. What, and your teacher would have to, cl to well, clean all the underpants? The well, well they, they did. The, well, I don't know how it happened, but they used to have little pants drying out there all the time. All lined up? All lined up. Oh. GBviews at gbviews.com. Have you got smelly memories? Let us know. <laughs>
GB views are cheaper. And how do you fix it? Like you said, soap and water doesn't cost a mm. lot, does it? There shouldn't really be an excuse, should there, for dirty okay. kids at school. Now, the migration mayhem, it continues. 872 migrants were detected crossing the channel on Saturday, making it the highest number on a single day seen this year. And the timing couldn't be worse for Rishi Sunak as MPs return to Westminster from summer recess today, expecting not only that huge spike in migration, but a large number of angry parents too. Let's go to Madeleine Grant. Madeleine is a columnist and a parliamentary sketch writer at The Telegraph uh, for more on this. Back to school uh, in the classroom and in Parliament. <laughs> yeah, and it's a... Um... I wonder how many smelly pants there are there. <laughs> Oh, no, no, I think, I think that the, the rot is more kind of internal than external with MPs, perhaps. But, um, yeah, it's, it couldn't have started worse. I mean, no. normally, you know, the, the media cycle kind of eases into the return to Westminster, but there have been a number of very damaging stories. Uh, the school closure story, which is, you know, exactly the kind of issue that I think could be doubly damaging for the government because it's the sort of thing that parents do talk about at the school gates and people talk about yeah. on mum's net. It's the kind of mm. issue that immediately cuts through in a way that something more technocratic might not. Um, and as for the migrants, I mean, I think this, this has the potential to be exceptionally damaging also because the Prime Minister, for months, the line has been that return, that crossings are down on last year and this has to do with the PM's own policies rather than suggestions that it was because of, of less seasonal weather. And now on Saturday we had the single biggest number in, all year round. That really puts paid to the uh, the Prime Minister's line on this. Yeah. Tell you what, you've got good weather this week, so no, no reason to expect that those figures will go down this week. Precisely, yes, precisely. Mm -hmm. It's been, um, you know, unseasonably warm and looks to be so... Um, going into you know early mid September, so you know mm. this could this could just be the start of more. I mean, the, the papers are saying that for Rishi Sunak, this is make or break now on the small boats. I mean, this is one of his five pledges. He has mm. almost made himself a bit of a hostage to destiny with those five pledges. It would seem. Yes, I completely agree, especially because on on the issue of of the migrants, you know, it really does feel like um, you know while we remain bound by the UN convention. And while we're no longer part of the Dublin Agreement that we were in the EU, what, by which we were able to send some migrants back to France, um, that actually, you know, the, the hands are tied. There's not much that, 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 that the government appears to be able to do right now. You know, once migrants get in a dinghy and if they make that journey safely, they're effectively in the UK and there is, you know, we can't send them back because there's nowhere we can send them. Mm. Madeleine, they could have done something about this concrete situation, though, in schools. How on earth has it come to this that it is so last minute that we wait till the end of the summer holidays, classrooms are, are coming back, but yet they're not coming back? It wasn't as if they haven't known about this for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it seems like the sort of thing that's been just put on the back burner for a very long time and no one has expected. I think the, the comparison with the cladding scandal was interesting one that your guest made earlier, that, that this is the kind of issue that no one really thinks about and it's neglected by various different um, groups in society, by local authorities, by ministers, perhaps by schools, and then suddenly it all flares up in a really drastic way and it requires immediate action. Mm. But it isn't going to get immediate action. You see, the thing that really makes my blood boil, you get Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, he goes on television and he's got this, he's got very good at pious looks, very, I am a sensible adult in the room here. I vow we will spend what it takes to fix unsafe schools lie, lie, lie. This is coming from existing budgets and it was already allocated for classroom assistance or equipment or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. It's just, just a terrible feeling in responsibility. Well, especially as, you know, in the last week or so, the ONS forecast for the UK economy have been significantly revised upwards, suggesting that they, they were being way too pessimistic and governments were... Our government was basing its projections on pr projections that were themselves faulty. But there is clearly a bit more in the system than people had bargained for. So, mm -hmm. Bit of know, wriggle room. Yeah. But perhaps. they want to bring taxes down, don't they, in terms... Uh, before the next which election? Is, I mean, which is also important because I mean I think that one of the things that the 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 fact that those forecasts were so off the mark suggests is that actually that raising taxes 
um, over the last year was perhaps unnecessary and that they were being too overcautious. They were being too treasury brain more mm -hmm. than they needed to be. Mm. Okay, Madeleine Grant, really good to see you this morning. Thank you so much. But what know? I'd like to know is, if there was to be an accident in some school, somewhere in the land, with this rack concrete, surely that is criminal irresponsibility on behalf of the government. Surely somebody deserves to go to jail knowing mm. they know there is a problem with this concrete, and yet they're saying, well, look, we'll carry on until something happens. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I would imagine that it might well be in a, you know, a situation akin to the cladding scandal where there's various different parties involved and they all blame each other and we never get to the bottom of it. And, of course, it's the, the kids that suffer, and partic particularly re reprehensibly, in my opinion, after, you know, all the disruption of lockdown the last few years. Yeah. The thought that there is kids that might not be yeah. going back to school this week is just, you know, beyond appalling. But, Madeleine, this is not just schools we're talking about. These are civil service buildings. Mm. These are buildings that have been uh, converted from offices to domestic accommodation now. These are, what else are we talking Hospitals. about? Police stations, hospitals, mm. yeah? Um, so many types of buildings, so many people at risk from all of this, and it has been known for 40 years. This stuff had a sell-by date. It was, it was building on the cheap. And it was only ever supposed to last 30 years. And now that it's lasted 50 years and 60 years, it's, it's absolutely scandalous. It, it is, yeah. they know the price of everything and the value of nothing. And this applies, of course, to successive governments on this one. But I think particularly the Conservatives, while in part, they knew there was a big problem with this and they have done nothing about it. And, um, you know, so for the Chancellor to say we will spend what it takes to fix unsafe schools, I put it to you today, is a lie. It is an absolute lie. And we've been putting that to government ministers throughout the programme this morning. Madeline, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. And perhaps you're a grandparent or a parent of a child who cannot go to school today. Perhaps you are uh, learning from home today, just like in the COVID lockdown. Do let us know if that affects you, that story. GBviews at gbnews.com. Now, here's your latest weather forecast with Jonathan Bauntree. That warm feeling inside from boxed boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, a good morning to you. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is set to turn increasingly hot over this coming week with high pressure in charge and we are tapping into air from continental Europe as well, really allowing those temperatures to rise. There is a little bit of mist and fog around first thing this morning, but that will clear off fairly readily and then certainly by late morning afternoon there will be a good chunk of sunshine across the vast majority of the UK. A little breezy around the southwest and gusty along coastlines here and still cloud lingering across the very far north of Scotland, providing certainly a different feel to the day compared to elsewhere where temperatures will be widely in the mid to high 20s. It'll be a fairly fine end to the day as well. Some late sunny intervals before we see clear skies for the vast majority overnight. Probably a reduced chance of fog because the breeze will just be that bit stronger and it will turn quite gusty for the Banai Brikaniog and also Eriri. But temperatures generally holding up around 14 to 16 degrees Celsius, so quite a mild warm start to Tuesday morning. Essentially, we do it all again a good amount of sunshine for the vast majority of us. A little bit of higher base cloud wanting to push its way into western England, Wales, Northern Ireland might make the sunshine hazy at times and the cloud still lingering for the Isle of Lewis, parts of Orkney and the Northern Highlands as well. But temperatures up by a few degrees, climbing towards 30 degrees Celsius across parts of southern England. Temperatures looking like they'll peak on Wednesday and Thursday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from boxed boilers Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Well, still to come, we'll go through all the biggest sports stories with Paul Coit. That's next. You're watching GB News, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. This uh, school situation collapsing concrete, um, affecting so many people. So many of you got a view on this one. Yeah. John says, so is the government going to compensate parents who now have to take time off if their children are not allowed to go to school? Are employers going to let people off to look after their children? No, nope. and no, nope, I would have thought. No, no. And Sean says, there's no money to make schools safe for children, but there is £8 million to spend each day on illegal immigrants. Uh, the foreign aid budget, a lot of you are saying, what is the problem? We spend billions on foreign aid, mm. now spend it on our schools, which you say you haven't got a penny to pay for. Um, David says, Laura is wrong, that was our education uh, uh, expert earlier, when she says that failure to give foreign aid will cause problems further down the line. It is not our responsibility to fund a lot of these countries, many of which are rife, rife with corruption. Uh, don't we give India money, yet they can fund a moon program, a sun space program um, as well, and that goes on. It's not not England's responsibility, says Stuart, uh, for the situation in other countries. And, um, and just a quick word about smelly children. Over to you, our smelly correspondent, on that one. <laughs> Yeah, this is a story uh, this morning in the Daily Express that poor pupil hygiene is set to get worse in the next year, apparently due to cost of living. Uh, Shelley says you can actually buy a bar of soap for under 30 pence and toothpaste is just 45 pence in some shops, such as Home Bargains or Aldi. This is just sheer laziness and yet again, parents putting the blame elsewhere. This is bad, lazy parenting. Yeah, my mother always said soap and water doesn't cost much. No, it doesn't Is it much. Aldi or Aldi? I would say Aldi. I don't know the right so word to say. Aldi or say? Aldi? Aldi. 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 Mm, Aldi. Anyway. Paul Coit, how do you say it? Aldi you drive, Aldi you go and buy things in. Right. Did you smell at school? Well, you know what? I always <laughs> smelt very lovely at school. But there was always... I know, there's always one kid. Always there now. was always one kid, yeah. and I always remember him now. And he wasn't... He didn't look smelly. But he was the smelly kid. Yeah. It was like pig pen in the old Charlie Brown. Yeah. You remember Charlie Brown? Yeah. And it was always the puffs of, mm -hmm. yeah, bless him. Oh, no. I don't know where he is now. Well, you wouldn't be but... allowed to mock them nowadays. That no. Would be, that we didn't. Would be uh, nobody see. even did. We were even nice in those days, but it was just like, whew. <sighs> One of those. No, we weren't nice. No, <laughs> we had songs and everything. We were oh, horrible. Oh, you didn't. No. We did. Oh no, that's. But did you? Did you feel bad about it now? Yeah, you do. Oh, have it's... you ever thought of like going? Listen, no, because no. <laughs> the same guys would be sixty odds now, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. And they'd say, remember, you used to poop in your pants and then sit in them all day in oh, school. Oh, yeah. I remember that. the kid. That, I remember a kid sitting in the um, in the hall at uh, when we were sitting at before uh, at uh, when we were right at the start of the day. Anyway, I remember him sitting there, and then the pool that would then move out from around. Everybody would move out yeah. when he did that. We used I to think it was only song. about four then. Who oh, sang that, disgusting. come on without, come on within, you ain't smelt nothing like that. And then we'd put his name in there. Right, did it rhyme with much <laughs> Quinn? Well, anyway, anyway. <laughs> uh, the back pages, let's look at those today. Um, priceless, the mirror says Arsenal's uh, signing Declan Rice, 105 million quid. They spent on him a bargain after he sank my new hearts, including my own, in their 3-1 
stealing win yesterday. Uh, Civil War in Manchester, the Telegraph says Red Devils winger Jaden Sancho thinks he's been scapegoated by Eric Ten Hag. Um, I think that's going to develop into an interesting story. I don't know where that will end up. Guardian also picks up on the Gunners win, but there's also focus on this week's Rugby World Cup match for England. Uh, Steve Borthwick, the manager, facing a host of injury concerns ahead of Saturday's match against Argentina. Um, you and I were, were texting each other during the match yesterday. Yeah. Um, Spurs fan and a Manchester United fan yeah, watching yeah. Arsenal win. I mean, I, I, <laughs> that was an I, interesting one. Well, I thought, well, a couple of things I want to say here. Uh, I thought we had that one in time added on, right, yeah, of sure. course. BAR thought otherwise. Yeah. Are we not all a bit fed up? I don't know about you, but wasting time is part of the game in my opinion. I don't want my full 90 minutes. I just want tactics come into play, people to waste time, people to do whatever it takes to win a game. I don't care. I don't want my value for money that I play 11 minutes extra time at the end. That's just me. You would say that now, though. I mean, no, but you, I mean well, come well, on, I two goals at... in, in injury time. Yeah. If it had been the other way around, I mean, look at Fergie time for crying out loud. I mean, you had a lot of time where time was added on, which helped, didn't it, back in the day? Yeah, but come on. Nine minutes, ten minutes, coming in as regular added on time. So, so, all right, well... I think it's a legitimate part of the game to waste 30 seconds or so. But do you not think that it's good for, for no. the crowd no. to even think, look, we get a full game because the ball is out of play for so much? No. So, therefore, you can make up for that and get 90 minutes of a game of football? Nothing should be more than 90 minutes. No pantomime should be more than 90 minutes. No movie should be more than 90 minutes. Mm. Things bore me if they're more than 90 minutes. Right apart from this show, which I stick with the whole way, by the way. <laughs> very listen, good, I got, very I, good. Listen, I've got to tell you, though, the, um, I, I was the same as you, especially, so we, it was a great goal, wasn't it, from Marcus Rashford, 1-0 up. Then, man, then Arsenal go and score within a minute. Great goal they as well. Goal, it was a very good goal. So 88th minute, Garnacho goes through, you go crazy, and it looked like it was going to be a Manchester United win. Now, VAR... If you look at it one way, it, VAR says it was offside. By a millimetre. By a millimetre, but a millimetre, a metre, yep. you know, it, it's still offside. Eric Ten Hag is saying he's blaming the angles of the camera, but it, it was offside, which is very unfortunate. Mm. Then Declan Rice comes through and then scores uh, right into, uh, into added time, which, by the way, everybody's like, oh, amazing, amazing. If, if it hadn't hit Johnny Evans... Mm, it wouldn't have gone in. It wouldn't have gone in. It was just going... Well, I, I think he's a great player. I think he's a great buy. He's oh, a, he is a great he's a, buy. He's a, he's a player I would have liked to have seen. He is a terrific player. And um, you've got Johnny Evans and you've got um, Harry Maguire. I mean, they're the, the, back, the pairing there at the back, they're, they're older than we are. Eamon. I think we probably could have done it. Yeah, bit. yeah. Um, this Manchester United situation with Jaden Sancho, I mean, there are reports that the Glazers have taken the club off the market, are looking yeah. £10 billion pounds for this. Yeah. Um, we have to fire sale a lot of players for financial play, uh, fair play rulings. Sure. Alanga being one of them, scored yep. for Forrest on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And now you've got Jaden Sancho saying, hey, just give me a break. Well, uh, and he's he's not been picked. He wasn't picked yesterday. He wasn't on the bench either no. yesterday. I mean, this is a what seventy-five million pound player yeah, comes yeah. over, and he, he was brilliant yeah. over in Germany. Um, Eric Ten Hag had said that he had dropped him. Uh, the reason for because of his performance in training, we did not select him, was what Eric Ten Hag said. Yeah. So normally a player would say nothing. Now this is when it starts kicking off because Jaden Sancho then went on social media said, "I won't allow people to uh, say, saying things that are completely untrue." I've conducted myself very well in training this week. I believe there are other reasons for this matter. I won't go into... I've been a scapegoat for a long time, which isn't fair. And like you say, they, this can, there can only be one winner in this, and I don't think it's going to be Jacob yeah. Sancho. We've got... Um, you know, we, we look at uh, other people that have taken on Eric Ten Hag. Look at Ronaldo. He came out second against him, so where this is going to go, I don't know. So it's a wise decision. Yeah, very interesting to see mm. what happens. I, I would be useless in training as well. It's like TV. I hate rehearsals. Yeah, yeah, sure. Not that we, we don't rehearse. <laughs> I don't know if it's obvious or not, but we don't rehearse this programme. <laughs> but, um, no, I just can't... I can't do rehearsals. Can you do rehearsals? No, it's not the same me. energy. Prep, it's no. not the same energy. Doing, you know, doing your homework and stuff, and I'll like, no, it's like on the way in. I'll sit here, and, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. See a bit for the red night, light. I'm like, ah, oh, I'll just watch Antiques Roadshow, mm. and then I'll write it on the, in the car on the way in. So it, it is. There's there's a lot of great. Like Jimmy Greaves was also a terrible trainer. 
and then would go out on the pitch and then... Mm. But the thing is, that's all that matters. If they deliver when they're playing in the main game, that's the most important thing. So there's something funny that's... Yeah, and what's the point of getting injured in a training match? Uh, look at the amount of players that get injured. Mm. Uh, with that sort of thing as well. Um, Max Verstappen, quick word. Very quick word. He's won again. Yeah. That's all I can say. That ten I in Italian a row? Grand Prix, ten in a row. That's another one for uh, Red Bull, first and second. It was the Italian, and so Carlos Sainz and uh, the Ferrari, they fought for a moment. There was a possibility, uh, but he got the biggest cheer because he was on the podium, but... No, again, Max Verstappen, it's just like... He's very good, isn't he? He is very good, but then again, he's got a really good car mm. as well. So that's all that anybody's looking at. You just think, OK, it's I wonder what he smells again. like after a race. I think he smells oily, yeah, actually. Yeah. Slightly oily. He smells fragrant today. I think he's fragrant now, but uh -huh. I, yeah, but, uh, but slightly slightly oily. OK. I think um, so. If you, if you, you know, you, were you at school and you sat beside somebody smelly, but maybe now you sit down beside somebody. Does a smelly person at school stay a smelly person for life? Well, you'd hope they'd That's learn the a lesson. Yeah. Would you tell someone, Eamon? If, if someone was with you and they were smelt... Oh, I, used, goes, I, used used to work, I used to work in the sports department opposite a guy who had such awful B.O. Like, oh, it, made you, it literally made you go... Yeah. Yeah, I it know, was yeah, so yeah, ghastly. Yeah. I've never smelled anything yeah. like it. And I, what I had to do at the end of the day was to put cups... <laughs> Uh, on the windowsill and around the office beside him with air fresheners oh in it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, he was so... Honestly, it was sickening. But never had the guts to say to him, uh, you stink. Oh it's so goodness. personal, isn't uh, it? Yeah. But, I mean, can, he, can, can they not the... smell themselves? See, that's what I can't work out. This Because sometimes it's so strong. I used to have a flatmate and the feet... Oh, my... It was that again. Yeah. But you think... Please, mm. just. Uh, but uh, I also know someone that actually said said to a friend once and said, "Like, excuse me, but you, your your smell is quite offensive. You need to do something about it." And obviously, they're very offended. Yeah. But sometimes Someone's it would take a them. friend mm -hmm. to yeah. just have a quiet word. Is it easier to tell a man he's smelly than to tell a woman she's oh, smelly? Oh, definitely. Yes. Yeah? Definitely. You think so? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Mm. I don't think you can tell a woman without really, really upsetting her. But Ellie, I would tell you, would and you? you smell lovely. Thanks. I just want to make that clear now. I don't want you feeling paranoid. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you Mr. always Paul. smell lovely. He does. <laughs> he does. He even speaks fragrantly. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Paul Coit. Do you stay with us still to come? All of the top stories from the papers with Chris Akabusi and Dawn Neeson. You're watching GB News, Britain's News Channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wooten, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel...
Welcome back. It's papers time. Let's bring you up to date, shall we? And on the front page of the eye, Hunt vows to make schools safe at any cost. But the Treasury say the government shouldn't expect new money anytime soon. So how is it going to do that? OK, mm. councils allow staff to work from the beach. Front page of the Daily Mail. OK, this is... Uh... <laughs> The number of local authority employees log on to their day jobs from sunny destinations is on the up. It's into its hundreds, I think 708 or so uh, jobs you can get with your local council, but you can work from anywhere abroad. That Independent. Nice. That'd be very nice. Mm. Independent leads with thousands of babies facing hospitalisation. Life-threatening virus this winter as the government delays a vaccine. In The Telegraph this morning, the Prime Minister will cave in overturning the ban on onshore wind farms to starve off a rebellion. Well, joining us to go through the papers in more detail this morning is Olympian Chris Akabusi and former editor of The Daily Star, Dawn Neeson. So, so what does that mean? They don't, they, they, they're they going to ban onshore wind farms, is that right? Well... Pe I've, I've only just delved into it, but, but yeah, apparently he's going to face a rebellion um, from within his party uh, about the um, onshore wind farms and the opposition are also poised to, be, to join in. Really, it's the everyone's back to work and we are ramping up to the election and you can see right now that the Prime Minister is going to be staving off all sorts of rebellions so um, everybody can get what they want. I just want to know, what difference does it make if I've got a wind farm out in the water or in a farmer's field behind basically me? Basically, this story is, since 2015, um, it's been um, enshrined in law that if one person in an area complains to the local council about an onshore wind farm, then it's off. Well, that's guaranteed, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. So what they've done is they're relaxing that rule. This is what the amendments are, that they're, uh, they're talking about. They're relaxing that rule so it, it takes more than that, just one person complaining. So that's mm. the basis of this. But so as a, as are, are we for or against onshore wind farms then? I, I live in the centre of, of London, so it's not going to affect me personally. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, but as Chris has pointed out, this is just more electioneering, isn't it? It's like um, uh, Rishi Sunak trying to keep as many Tories on side as he possibly can to get this amendment through. Yeah. Right, OK. Now, let's talk about this um, school concrete um, situation. And, of course, it affects civil service buildings and hospitals and police stations and all sorts of things. Um, I put it to you that when I hear, and I'm not going to stop about this today, when I hear the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, saying we'll spend what it takes to fix unsafe schools, he is lying. Well, look, this has been a ticking time bomb. It's um, these... Rack. Could I just say something? Yes, we talk about ticking time bomb. Something's <laughs> bombed, something's ticked and gone off, because why have they just suddenly decided this weekend to do this? I, I put it to you, something has happened and we're not being told about it. Well, it's something that's been on the back burner that has... But you just don't, your weekend before the kids go back to school, suddenly say, oh, and incidentally, we've been working on this concrete business, so let's close 100 schools. Yeah, but maybe what's, what's happening is that the opposition is going to make a good old play on it, and they realise right now that over the last 30 years, when I say we, the political class, because both parties have been beaten power over the last 30 years, the political class have not deemed this of high enough priority. This is about this is classic short-termism. All I'm interested in is my short-term in office and it's been kicked down the road and now the chickens have come home to roost. Because right now, right here, right now, the 30-year out-of-life expense of these rack buildings has come where it is very possible that a building could collapse. Now, you know, we're being assured that it's not that desperate at this moment in time, but these AVAT prog programmes only got a 30-year life, life, 30 life span, and we're at it. We're right at the zenith. So uh, I suspect that, again, political capital can be made out of this by the opposition, bearing in mind that Blairism was there over the whole period, and austerity measures taken after the global financial crisis meant also it was kicked down the road and not, not looked at. Education was not... Budget was held back. Where are we going to get the money from right here, right now? I've got no clue. The, the, you, you're right, Chris. I mean, this isn't just the Conservative government. This has been known about since 1994. Mm. No-one's done anything about it since then. We're aware, as you say, it is a ticking time bomb. And I listened to countless interviews with various ministers over the weekend trying to explain, as you point out, Eamon, 
why suddenly two days before the kids go back to school, it's suddenly an issue. And I still have no idea what the actual answer is. It seems to be, oh, there was a new report done over the summer period and we realised it was more dangerous than we thought. It was very fudgy. No one actually has given me a straight answer yet. If someone out there listening or watching over the weekend has got the answer, let us know. Because I couldn't get to the bottom of why suddenly this is an issue. Yeah. We've known about it since 1994. I remember sitting in schools in the 80s with bits of concrete falling off and being yeah. shifted out to prefabs because yeah. schools were dangerous back then. Mm. It, it's, it's astonishing and that it's just now... And it's scramble, isn't it, for parents out there who have, who have had to find childcare. Well, exactly for that. For kids that are sitting at home today. Yeah, exactly that. Suddenly, you know... And, and parents are worried. Is, is it safe? I mean, what, we, what schools need to do now, or what the government needs to do, is get structural engineers into all of these schools and reassure mm. parents who are worried that the school in question is safe. Yeah. Well, and it's a mess. Look, look the, there, there was 15,000 schools that were built with this, and at the moment, we've identified 156. Well, so they, and they still we haven't got the full that. list, have we? No, that's that's right. still to come. So there's a lot to be done. Yeah. And as has already been stated, it's not just schools, it's government buildings, military yeah. establishments, because it was cheap. police stations. It was cheap concrete at the time. Yeah. Let's talk, Don, about shoplifting. Right. right, so there's a big story about this uh, of Tesco's over the weekend talking about uh, the increase in this and uh, the abuse their staff have, which is, which is awful. It's a terrible position to, to be put in. Yeah. But I put it to you, I'm going to say something controversial uh -oh. now. I think when it comes to Tesco and Sainsbury's and Waitrose and Aldi and whoever else is out there, that it is not a police problem. I think they should pay for their own security because they're making enough money out of this crisis at the moment. Um, yeah, there is a lot of profiteering going on in supermarkets. I completely agree with you on that one. However, is that really the fault of the actual workers on the shop floor who are facing... No, but I'm just abuse? saying it's not my problem either. If Tesco are making, you know, 50% profit on something or whatever, I just think there is a, a cost of living crisis out there. They're making enough money that they can handle the risks that go with that, is what I'm saying. Yeah, well, I mean... The, the I... police... Listen, there's no point saying... I heard somebody saying, where there's CCTV footage, the police have, a, have yes. an obligation to investigate and whatever it is. Why say that when they don't have the manpower to do that? Well, this is the problem. I mean, there's an interview in here, this is in the Metro as well, with a chap called Richard Inglis, who runs three co-op stores in Hampshire. And he's been told by the, the, the local police in that area that they would only come along and investigate shoplifting theft if the value was more than £200. Well, basically, it's giving carte blanche to shoplifters to go in... Free for all. ..not only abuse staff, but also just walk out with, yeah. you know, if it's, you know, less than 200 so, quid, you're fine, get away with it. Uh, and for me, this is actually a much bigger, wider problem. This is, this is a societal problem. Mm. It's not a Tesco's problem. Um, you remember a few weeks ago, there was all this Missy guy and his tribe who would run in and they would announce that they're running in, they'd kick the doors in and just run riot. Yeah. And my challenge is that this is a direct result of uh, the defenestration of the male the male figure, the male figure in the home, the male figure in society, where young men are releasing this unbridled power because they've never experienced the force of a man at home, 4% of of families are born up, brought up with single-parent single families. It's not the fault of mum at home who's doing her best. But if you haven't got a man at home saying, no! And really raising his voice to that young kid, so the young kid understands power and authority. You've got young 14-year-olds, 18-year-olds going in there with their unbridled power, never, ever, ever, and I know this is not what we do in these days, having a clip round the ear, the ear felt, or the dad going, no! But, Chris, but Chris, everything you've shouted at, everything you've said there, there will be people saying, you've just acted in an abusive way and that is that, not, not acceptable. That is what I'm saying yeah. about the defenestration of the male power. You need male authority. You need to, to, um, to understand that with the, your own personal rights becomes a responsibility to be a civil... Citizen, and I think that young men these days have been brought up over the last 30, 40 years without the power of the male authority figure at home and at school. Well, it's interesting you say that, but, um, you know, uh, my father was the ultimate deterrent. It never got to my father because we were always too scared of my mother. Um, <laughs> really, so so five boys in the house, and she was the one yeah. that uh, laid down the law and had to be said. Would she shout? Well, 
Yes, of course, she would shout. Okay. I mean, she would say to me, I mean, she died last November at 90, and she would say to me, don't you think you're old, too old or, or for me to slap you around the head? <laughs> she, would, she would say that, you know, and she would mean it. She would do it. No, I yeah. mean, we, we had, and I know you can't do this now, but we had a... It was never used, but there was a stick in yeah. the cupboard. And, and like your mum, my mum... Was go, it bamboo by any chance? <laughs> I think it <laughs> was, yeah. Uh, and, and, my and, mother used to start the school holidays. You go down to the hardware shop and get a bamboo yeah. cane. It was never used, but the threat was there. Ours was, was used. And, uh, yeah, and, and I think Chris is so right, though. I think there is a lack of discipline now, whether it's from your mum or your dad, but I, th I think a, a, a strong male roddle, a male well, well, roddle. Male or female. Well, no, no, but no, 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 in particular, Mel. I saw a picture on the TV where these young kids were kicking the, the, the door in the Tesco's with a woman the other side. Now, would you do that to your mother, your sister, your daughter? No, but these young kids so, have so, got absolutely no fear of kicking a door down and slapping down a woman. So, Chris... Now, if you had... Go on. Chris, you, you served, obviously, in the military, so there was a story uh, earlier on the week about uh, bringing national service back. Would you support that, then? Uh, when you say national service, it doesn't have to be in the military, but certainly I do believe, again, this is of the ritual of the rite of passage. Young males in particular need a rite of passage. And so, yes, if we had 18 months where you served society, you, you were the authority figure... Or, no, you were doing the um, security at Tesco's. And for 18 months, you worked a minimal pay to do the security. Oh, yes, join the military, whatever. Yeah. But you need to serve society so that you don't kick the doors down of society when you get into your twi early 20s. Mm -hmm. No. It's, you know, men and women came before you and built this society, and you can't destroy it just like that. You need a clip round the year, son. All right. Very we'll have, up there. We'll have a view on that at home. Do you agree with Chris? GBviews at gbnews.com. It doesn't matter if you agree or not. Or disagree. We don't have... Everyone's No, no, no. The, the point is, it's all talk again. It's all smoke and mirrors. There are not the police authorities there to implement fines. There's the court system's bunged up. Mm. There's not enough police officers there to do it. So why pretend they're going to investigate everything? They're not yeah. going to investigate everything. So there has to be another way of looking at this. I don't, I don't know what way that is, yeah. whether it's private security firms or... But what are they going to do, Eamon? What, so, so if, if, if a bunch of youths come into there, are you going to yeah. shoot them? No. So what are you going to do with these young kids right now who do not respect authority? Yeah, but you could have, um, what am I trying to say, guards, guards that there. For instance, a private company can slap you with a fine for parking your car in the yes. wrong place, right? Mm. So why can't a private company slap you for shoplifting because, out of because, Tesco? Because, Eamon, you and I, if... if, 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 if that authority figure says you're going to pay your fine. You'll pay your fine because you've been you've been brought up that way. Correct. Exactly. But this young kid, who is 18, doesn't give a flying feces about your authority figure. So if you are a guard, he's going to come in and try and slap you. And if you grab hold of him and you hurt his little finger, you're the one who's going to get done, not that kid. Mm. You've just, you've just undue force and attention on that kid. So this is the problem. This is what I'm trying to say is that actually he. Uh, and some of the she's have never experienced that thing. Oh, OK, yes, sorry, sir. I would never, ever shout at a policeman. I would never, you know, authority was important to me growing up. These young kids have got no sense of authority and their role in society. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. OK, Dawn and Chris, let's talk about this story in the Daily Express. We've been talking about it this morning. As poor pupil <coughs> hygiene is set to get worse this year. It's going to be more smelly kids. Oh. Cool. Oh, quite oh, come sad, on, actually. come on. This story I find very, very annoying. Why? <clears throat> well, because it, it's... You don't need to be rich to have a wash or clean your teeth. Correct. It's good old-fashioned soap and water. Correct. Does the trick. This is poor parenting. Correct. Mm -hmm. Nothing more, and the kids are the ones that are suffering. Yeah. We agree yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, totally. I, I agree. I, I agree with you. However, there is a challenge with the energy costs, and so you know, you might risk. Okay, I won't wash his PE shirt today. I'm going to do it on. I'm going to do it Thursday and Monday, and so on a Wednesday, it's a little bit whiffy. And the kid's got to bear the bear the punch. And wash it in the sink. I'm okay. sorry, yeah. in cold water. There's no excuses. I mean, you know, teach we the were kids to do it themselves. Well, yeah, we were brought up in a working class household. I know. Bang on about this all the time. And you know, you were you were brought up 
to be hygienic. You would hand wash stuff yeah. in the sink. You yeah. wouldn't use a washing machine if you couldn't afford to, you know, the yeah, around the well, electricity. You'd hand wash it yourself. The same, the same when I was going up with <clears> that. <throat> Cleanliness is next to godliness. Yeah. And plus, <laughs> to plus, 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 with this story, it's not the teacher's responsibility to wash kids' PE kit. No, but yeah. what do you do? Or, 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 or teach wash them children. How to, yeah, or wash children or, or teach them how to clean teeth. They're there to teach them maths and English. It's parents. So what do you do when there's so many kids in the classroom and, you, and they're protected characteristic? You can't say, you are so many kids, because you can't do that either. You cannot say to this money kid, you are a money kid. No, you, you wouldn't. No, I'd phrase it you? slightly better, Chris. Just slightly better. But okay. how, how do you phrase it? Then? I would how probably you... talk to the parents because yeah. it's not the child's fault. No, but in the meantime, you've got a money kid in the classroom who it's not his fault, and all of the children are sort of stepping back from him or her. How do you support that child's mental health and wellness in the classroom? Well, it's not her fault. It's, it's well, fault. here's here's ways of dealing with things. Uh, thanks very much, folks, for, for getting in touch and sharing your smelly remedies. Uh, <laughs> Wendy, <laughs> Wendy, I had a boss that stank of body odour. Oh, no. Finally, one of my colleagues rang the smelly guy's wife and she dealt with it. He never stank again. How because, is the wife not picking up on it, though? Because what? she would be so embarrassed that he represents <clears throat> her and yeah. her family that she's saying... You're never going out like that again. Well, it's a good, a good way around it, I think. Tell the wife. Mm. Tell the husband. <laughs> George says it's because uh, people are struggling with energy costs to put on washing machines yeah. and they can't afford going to the laundromat outside. That's that my point. That's but my point. Yeah, yeah but it's don't, don't say it's not an excuse. Yes, just hand wash it in the sink. I'm yeah. sorry, what is wrong with that? To be fair, though, mm. my washing machine broke a few weeks ago. I had to go to the... What do we call them here? It's not laundromat. laundromat. What washing machine. Uh, uh, washing... Um, uh, La yeah. Laundrettes. Laundrettes. That's Sorry. Laundrette. Monday morning. And it was £7.50 for a yeah. wash. Yeah. So if you have a, a, a dark wash and a light wash, it was 15 quid. Well, we're not yeah. talking about sheets and towels and stuff here, are we? We're talking about kids' PE kits no, and things but, like but that. But also, but there's a growing amount. I think if you're a smelly kid, you're a smelly adult as well. Oh, really? Exactly. Then says, I had a work colleague who wore the same suit day in, day oh, out, no. week in, week out, year in. You're getting no. the idea here. Oh. Uh, we told him to get it cleaned. He was definitely smelly. What is wrong with people? Christina, <laughs> there were two smelly people in my year, a girl who I made friends with and me. Oh. Oh. Well, she came a from a better person. off and educated family and I was brought up in poverty. She used to share her snacks with me, was very kind and very intelligent. We would sit next to each other smelling in class, but nobody else came near us. Oh. Oh. She and I were bullied and got beaten up occasionally, but things turned out OK by the time I left school and found a job. I love cleaning, being clean, but to this day look a scruff at most times because I'm always cleaning and tidying up. But at least you, you put it right. At least okay, you put no. it right. So Christina was smelly child and has now grown up to very, be very clean. have an obsession with cleanliness. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's, that's where true. it goes, though. Maybe it's do, they it goes. Do, <clears throat> do they teach health and hygiene in school still? Well, the sort of thing they should teach. Well, that's what I mean, we, Don, we, can I just... Like, before I even... And Chris applies to this as well. You're the sort of people, before I even see, I know you look fragrant. And then you come in and you... And doesn't she smell fragrant they today? smell lovely. <laughs> they smell lovely. <laughs> smell lovely. Um, well, Chris... As, as for you, Ellie... Oh. Anyway. Oh, no! Oh. Lies! You know, lies. Smelled, they were lies. She smells oh, no. beautiful. That was oh, lies. Lies, oh, lies, lies, lies. Oh, uh, let's go to the break. We're back talking about <laughs> schools collapsing after the weather update. Here we go. <laughs> Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, a good morning to you. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is set to turn increasingly hot over this coming week with high pressure in charge and we are tapping into air from continental Europe as well, really allowing those temperatures to rise. There is a little bit of mist and fog around first thing this morning, but that will clear off fairly readily and then certainly by late morning afternoon there will be a good chunk of sunshine across the vast majority of the UK. A little breezy around the southwest and gusty along coastlines here and still cloud lingering across the very far north of Scotland providing certainly a different feel to the day compared to elsewhere where temperatures will be widely in the mid to high 20s. It'll be a fairly fine end to the day as well. Some late sunny intervals before we see clear skies for the vast majority overnight. Probably a reduced chance of fog because the breeze will just be that bit stronger and it will turn quite gusty for the Banai Brikaniog and also Eriri. But temperatures generally holding up around 14 to 16 degrees Celsius, so quite a mild warm start to Tuesday morning. Essentially, we do it all again. 
a good amount of sunshine for the vast majority of us. A little bit of higher base cloud wanting to push its way into Western England, Wales, Northern Ireland might make the sunshine hazy at times and the cloud still lingering for the Isle of Lewis, parts of Orkney and the Northern Highlands as well. But temperatures up by a few degrees, climbing towards 30 degrees Celsius across parts of Southern England. Temperatures looking like they'll peak on Wednesday and Thursday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it. Like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Schools across Britain could be facing months of closures due to fears over a concrete collapse. Good morning, it's 7 o'clock on Monday the 4th of September. This is Breakfast on GB News with Eamon and Ellie. Here's what's leading the news this morning. As students across the country are set to return to class this week, the government is under pressure to reveal the exact number of schools at risk of collapse. This, as Jeremy Hunt says, there will be no extra cash for schools affected by the crisis. Elsewhere, and as Parliament returns from a six-week recess, the Prime Minister has been warned that it's make or break on small boats, as the Home Office recorded the highest daily number of crossings in the Channel so far this year. Meanwhile, Sir Keir Starmer says there will be no income tax rises if Labour wins power. The Labour leader vowed to kick the economy out of the doom loop of low growth and high taxes. And we'll bring you your latest forecast with Jonathan Vauntry. Temperatures are on the rise this week and we could reach 30 degrees Celsius for the first time since the start of July. Join me later for all the weather details. To our top story now, and the Chancellor says there will be no extra cash for schools affected by the concrete crisis, with repair costs coming from the existing education budget. Now, Jeremy Hunt's comments come amid a growing demand for ministers to release the full list of buildings affected and when they knew. Parents are being left in the dark. Millions of pupils returning to school just this week. Well, the Shadow Education Minister Bridget Phillipson says Labour will force a vote this week if the government do not publish the full information. We can't be confident that we know the full picture because ministers are refusing to publish the full list of school affected. affected. It's a scandal that parents are being left in the dark just at the point of the new school term starting. Ministers need to be upfront, publish that list and get a grip. 
We think it's vital that the government publishes the full list of schools affected. They need to get a grip of this situation. But if they refuse to do so, we'll force a vote in the House of Commons this week and make it happen so that parents aren't left in the dark. You know, as a result, a lot of you are just incredulous as to why this wasn't known until this weekend. And um, we just want these ministers to come come clean, yeah. say it straight. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I put it uh, to someone earlier this morning, an education expert, we have got the money for this. People say there's no money to repair these schools. We've got a foreign aid budget. Mm. Like, surely that foreign aid budget shouldn't be foreign anymore. It just should be an aid, aid budget for what we need in these countries. Well, it needs clearing up, doesn't it? Because we were told that the teachers increase in salary, the pay rise they were asking for, they weren't going to get it out of those pre-existing budgets. But now 156 school buildings are going to be re rebuilt with those budgets. It doesn't quite make sense, does but it? There, there, it isn't just like there is a, uh, a, a cash cow sitting there that we can dip into and suddenly find this money to do all this. The money doesn't exist anyway. The money has been allocated. And if you're going to start repairing your classrooms, then you haven't got a classroom assistant or you haven't got books or you haven't got facilities for that class. Yeah. School trips are goodness knows what else. So the education uh, curriculum will suffer as a result. And the children will suffer as well. Well, our national reporter, Theo Chikomba, is outside one of the schools affected for us now. This is Honeywood School in Coggeshall in Essex. Good morning to you, Theo. So back to school for so many pupils up and down the country today, but not at the school that you're at. That's right. Well, at this school, it's just one of many that we heard in that announcement last week. Uh, many parents would have undoubtedly uh, been preparing uh, for their children uh, to come back to school following uh, almost six weeks off during the summer. And of course, this now means they have to try and find alternative plans. But of course, the schools are working hard to ensure that the children don't miss out on their education. This school here in Honeywood in Essex, uh, well, Honeywood School, should I say, in Essex, uh, is just one of those which has been affected. Fortunately, we are kindly joined by the head teacher this morning. Thank you so much for your time, uh, James. It's uh, it's been one of those things, uh, not something you would expect. A few days before school, what was it like when you first heard about this issue following the surveys? Uh, well, it was quite last minute. Uh, we got we were informed on Thursday afternoon. Uh, I was at home at the time, uh, so I quickly contacted some of the leadership team and said, "We've got a bit of a problem here. Can you get in in the morning?" Uh, and yeah, they were all pretty shocked actually when I when I first informed them. Um, but actually. We've, uh, we've spent Friday putting a plan together. Uh, we've still got a lot of work to do, but the priority was to get some information out to our families as soon as possible, which we, which we have done. So what is the scale of the issue, particularly at your school at the moment? Uh, so 22 of our classrooms are affected, which uh, are all in our main block. So it's two main corridors and 22 additional office spaces and other rooms. That equates to about half of the school. Uh, so there's no way we can get all the children into the school without doing something uh, and finding alternative accommodation. We've heard about uh, the cost of this. Has there been any indication of you know, how much this will cost and what facilities will you need temporarily at the moment as well? Uh, well, I don't know how much it's going to cost in the long term, uh, but I have uh, met with both our trust and a, our DfE caseworker and have been assured that it'll all be paid for. So we, we've set up the mechanisms to basically go and do whatever we need to do and then recoup the cost afterwards. Uh, the main thing that we're going to need is some form of uh, teaching space. Uh, what we really want is something on site. We don't really want to be busing children to other places because uh, we, we just don't think that that's going to work as effectively and not keep them as part of our community so we need 22 classrooms basically to, to get the school up and running. And for parents of course uh, what are some of the concerns that they've had uh, undoubtedly they would have needed to go back to work sorting out logistics and things yeah. like that um, so what are you doing to kind of reassure them in this? and you say you're putting things in place as well to mm -hmm. ensure that their children can still get their education? Uh, yeah I mean no solution is going to be perfect at the moment that we've got. Uh, we've put, put out one communication to families on Friday quite detailed and we got quite positive response from that. I think the key worry for them is that 
if you've got children at particular points, say they're doing exams or they've just got here, or they were the children that were affected the most by the pandemic, the worry is, oh, there's another thing that's going to hit them and disrupt their education. And it's going to be a balancing act for us in terms of trying to manage getting as many children into the building as possible, um, but also making that done as, as equitably as possible. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time you. this morning. Well, as you heard from him, this is something that they're having to work around, uh, working with staff, working with uh, those who work with the school and ensuring that parents uh, understand what they can do to, to help their children uh, during this time. And of course, but it's an unwelcomed uh, message for many parents, but something they're going to have to work around in the next few days and weeks. Absolutely, Theo. A last-minute scramble for parents up and down the country, especially at that school that you're at now. Thank you so much for bringing that to us this morning. And astounding that her teacher saying they found out about this on Thursday afternoon. More trouble, meanwhile, for the Prime Minister as he deals with crumbling schools and a spike in migration. Parliament's back today. Matt, go to Madeleine Grant, my columnist and parliamentary sketch writer at The Telegraph, uh, joins us for all things politics on that one today. Well, a busy agenda. We expect the Education Secretary to be making an address. Uh, Jill and Keegan will make a statement in the Commons um, today, hopefully detailing the exact amount of schools that are affected by this. And um, Ellie's already outlined the concerns, why so late, why now, why, why announce this now? Yeah, exactly. And it's a, it's the kind of issue which, you know, politically, Labour have already been exceptionally vocal on this, but I think it's unlike many issues that get discussed in the Commons where it will be the kind of thing that people will be discussing in their everyday lives. Parents at the school gates will be talking about it now. The, the, the fear that after so much disruption during lockdown that kids will once again potentially be missing out on valuable days of school. Mm. That will really, I think, hit home in a way that not every political issue does. And it's, it's so important, isn't it? Because it is about children's safety at school. You couldn't risk the roof collapsing and, yeah. and you know, the worst happening. It could be an absolute tragedy. Exactly. Um, but the, the reality is there's been warnings about this for 30 years. We're talking about this in 1994. Yeah. Why has it come to the Thursday before term? We just heard that head teacher there finding out that half of his school building is unsafe mm. two days before term is meant to start. I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable. I think part of the reason that, that we're here is that you know, there, was, there has just been a lot of terrible infrastructure and very poor quality building work that's gone on in this country over previous decades. And I think that governments would just look at the scale of that and say, you know, well, that's not my fault. You know, it's something for someone else to figure out. But of course, the compound mess of every single responsible party essentially abdicating their responsibility means that it all comes to a head right now in such a dramatic way and without any kind of, you know, planning or provisions made for how you deal with that. Our whole system is rotten. It's crumbling as much as the, the concrete. But, you know, I, I can accept mistakes. I can accept all sorts of problems. What I can't accept is weasel words from politicians and them treating us all like idiots as if we're supposed to, to you know, accept what they say. Oh, we only found out about this on Friday and we let you know straight away. No, you didn't. It was like, you know, after the Second World War and bombing all over Britain, there were um, a lot of homes built that were called prefabs mm, yeah. and they were corrugated iron uh, constructions. And believe me, I remember them. I remember seeing them well into the 60s and maybe yeah. maybe beyond. They weren't supposed, they were only supposed to last a few months or so. Yeah, and in schools as well. They were very common in schools, weren't yeah. they? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's the same situation here. If they brought in a cost-saving measure that was supposed to last 15, 20 years, how come it lasted 40 or 50 years in terms of this? This is the really sad, awful thing about this. And you look at police stations, who, which are then transformed into restaurants and bars and apartments and all sorts of things. There are more buildings than we know about mm -hmm. which have this danger yeah. with them. So it's not just schools we're talking about, hospitals, civil service buildings, yeah. whatever, all of which are dangerous. It's fascinating, isn't it, how we, we are just... We, we're just living amongst the ruins of the, the good infrastructure that was left to us by the Victorians, basically. They built things high quality. We're still using the same mm -hmm, sewers. Mm -hmm. We're still using many of the same municipal yeah. buildings. And they have stood the test of time. You know, it is possible to do it properly mm. and doing high quality and without all of these cutting of corners. And, and I mean, I think your um, economics editor, Liam Halligan, is so fantastic on this about how 
the, one of the causes of the, the housing crisis is that over the years, the smaller builders have been completely taken out of the market. And it's often left to the, these big mm -hmm. companies that I think are much more likely to cut corners where they can and do things in a very kind of identical, uniform way. Report to way. the shareholders. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect storm in some ways. And I think perhaps after the, the war, there was a lot of building stuff on the cheap and perhaps we're paying the price for that mm. now. Maybe if we were to threaten corporate manslaughter uh, charges, if something came about with this, because as you were saying, I keep thinking of um, the Abervan disaster oh. in the 60s where the, the coal slag um, came down the, the hill. Mm. And, you know, we think, oh my gosh, this could never happen again or shouldn't be allowed to happen again. But you could have something like that happening again if a roof caved in on a school. Um, and someone has to be held responsible for it. So it's, to me, I think it's a resigning issue. If I was a minister, I think I'd be saying, wait a minute, you didn't tell me. I mean, Gillian Keegan, the Education Secretary, has been in her job a year. Mm. I wonder when she arrived and she was given the brief of education, did someone say, oh, and incidentally, we've got a couple of hundred schools around the country and the roofs may fall in. Which could look set to collapse. I wonder yeah, did when anybody did tell her that? Mm, no. And you wouldn't That's... want that on your hands, you're right. You, you, certainly, you certainly would. And if you did find out, you say, not for for me, you can have this job back unless you make all this sort of thing public. Yeah. I think it's frightening. What do you think? I think it is. And, and I, I think that much like with the cladding scandal, ultimately, I think that the issue has to be in some ways depoliticised. It has to become, yeah. there needs to yeah. be kind of maybe like a royal commission or something mm -hmm. where people can take a big cogent look. But ultimately, um, you know, the, the government is going to have to stump up the money for this because... Um, you know, it's the kind of issue where you could even justify further borrowing to sort it out because if this is long-term, yeah. shoddy infrastructure, it's not so much maybe let's get the, the apportioning of blame out of it, but this needs to be fixed and quickly because you cannot have kids in crumbling schools. So somebody 40, 50 years ago decided yeah, it's a bit too expensive to, to make real good, strong concrete. So what we'll do is we'll make something that looks like an aero bar basically, we'll pump it full of holes or whatever, and somehow this is cheaper. I'd love to know how much cheaper it was than the, than the real thing. The yeah. thing is, it can only last 20 years, 30 yeah. years maximum, but we've had it lasting 40 years, 50 years. We've had warnings about this. We knew when it was installed, it had a limited shelf life, yet no one has acted upon it. Then we have the chance of the Exchequer going on television yesterday, lying absolutely lying and saying we will spend what it takes to fix unsafe schools and that is not the case then he's the boss of the treasury and the treasury said oh, no we haven't we haven't got any money for this as you said if anything warrants more borrowing this is it if anything warrants mm. scrapping a foreign aid budget and spending it at home surely this is it as well. Mm. Madeleine Grant, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts. Uh, your views welcome throughout the programme this morning. What would you do if you were in charge of the education department? What do you think should be done about these buildings? GB views at gbnews.com. Let's bring you up to date with now with some of the other stories taking place today. And the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, is preparing to overturn the ban on building new onshore wind farms in a bid to quell a Tory rebellion. Changes to planning rules would mean that councils are, give, are able to give permission to build turbines in areas that there is a great public support and comes ahead of a vote in Parliament on the energy bill this week. Uh, the Ukrainian president has replaced his defence minister with a political ally in a bid to help with the war. Uh, he held his post since the start of Russia's invasion and took part in failed peace talks with Moscow last year. Meanwhile, President Zelensky says the time has come for new approaches. Several schools across the country have begun to use gender-neutral terms when describing uniforms. Prestigious schools, including Brighton College, have replaced the words girl and boy with uniform A and uniform B in their policy documents. Such institutions claim it could help to reflect children's self-identified genders. But critics have hit out at the move, demanding that parents need to push back. What a lot of rubbish. So what if you identify as a furry friend, which is what more and more young people are being allowed to get away with? They see themselves as a furry little cutesy-gutsy animal. Do they? 
Yeah, that was a survey out at the weekend. Really? More and more, it's sort of at record levels. Those who identify with being a gerbil or a hamster or a bunny rabbit, the little... Yeah, chuk I'm going to need yeah. Uniform C. Do what? There's only Uniform A and B so far for um, girls and boys. I'm going to need a Uniform C. So... Uh, I don't even want to start thinking about it anyway. Here's your weather forecast. Jonathan Vautry, it looks as it might be a good week. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, good morning to you. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is set to turn increasingly hot over this coming week with high pressure in charge and we are tapping into air from continental Europe as well, really allowing those temperatures to rise. There is a little bit of mist and fog around first thing this morning, but that will clear off fairly readily and then certainly by late morning afternoon there will be a good chunk of sunshine across the vast majority of the UK. A little breezy around the southwest and gusty along coastlines here and still cloud lingering across the very far north of Scotland, providing certainly a different feel to the day compared to elsewhere where temperatures will be widely in the mid to high 20s. It'll be a fairly fine end to the day as well. Some late sunny intervals before we see clear skies for the vast majority overnight. Probably a reduced chance of fog because the breeze will just be that bit stronger and it will turn quite gusty for the Banai Brikaniog and also Erari. But temperatures generally holding up around 14 to 16 degrees Celsius, so quite a mild warm start to Tuesday morning. Essentially, we do it all again. A good amount of sunshine for the vast majority of us. A little bit of higher base cloud wanting to push its way into Western England, Wales, Northern Ireland might make the sunshine hazy at times and the clouds still lingering for the Isle of Lewis, parts of Orkney and the Northern Highlands as well. But temperatures up by a few degrees, climbing towards 30 degrees Celsius across parts of Southern England. Temperatures looking like they'll peak on Wednesday and Thursday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Hi, I'm Dan Wooten. You can watch me live on GB News Monday to Thursday from 9pm. And did you know that you can also watch and listen live on our website, gbnews.com. You'll always be up to date on the latest breaking news, as well as enjoying the best stories, opinions and shows. You can even join the debate under our live player as you're watching. So head straight to gbnews.com on TV, radio and online. GB News, Britain's news channel.
It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Uh, Airbnb. So have you ever stayed in Airbnb, Ellie? Yes, I stay there all the time. I've got one book for next weekend. Oh, uh -huh. so a nice... Um, you're not a hotel person. What are the advantages you find with Airbnb? Check in when you like. You can cook. Yeah. You your kitchen. So it's more like a home. It's, it's like, like a home, a yeah. Holiday you home. You don't need to leave for it to be cleaned or anything. You can just stay all day. It's quite nice. Mm. Have you used it? Uh, no, no, but somebody, uh, spare room in the Norfolk Broads could now be a prime holiday destination just as long as you can get along with the current residents. The MP for North Devon is urging the government to do more to stop Airbnbs to curb the rise in short-term property debts because he says what it's doing is that it's somehow decimating local communities. Now, more than half of all rental properties have switched to short-term lets, meaning many Devon residents are having to move out of the county just to find a home. Well, there you go. Well, our South West of England reporter, Jeff Moody, has the story. A rare sunny day in Devon. Six million of us headed down to the West Country last weekend alone, piling into Airbnbs and holiday lets. And there's more accommodation than ever. Good news for the tourists, not so good for locals looking for somewhere to live. North Devon's MP, Selene Saxby, says it's a problem of balance. So whilst we warmly welcome those businesses up here that are renting out rooms to tourists and we need our tourists to come, um, we also need them to be able to go to the pub, to be able to go out to a restaurant and for those restaurants to have staff to work in them. And we, the situation for housing here is now so severe that we have large numbers of vacancies at our hospital, in social care, our public services. There are 1,800 holiday homes in North Devon, almost exactly the number of households currently on the waiting list for an affordable home. In beach resorts, one in four houses are registered on Airbnb. And that's the problem. Sam Richardson is a musician from St Agnes in Cornwall. He's written a song about the way second homes and holiday lets have destroyed his community. I caught up with him on the road. He seems like he's on a pretty constant trajectory of, of more and more properties being bought up by developers. Uh, sometimes they're flipped, sometimes they're, you know, full-time holiday lets. Um, again, there's, there's planning permission for a few um, affordable homes, as they say, but they never really seem to be particularly affordable. In a statement, Airbnb told GB News, we welcome regulation and have long led calls for the introduction of a host register to give authorities the information they need. The typical UK host rents their space for just three nights a month. And we want to work with policymakers to support everyday hosts and clamp down on speculators that drive local concerns. But those concerns aren't going away. My concern is that Cornwall, the whole of Cornwall, will end up with just sort of like a big holiday park, to be honest with you. I mean, it's a beautiful county. We've got some really great people. There's a really interesting history and culture down here. I'd well, be a bit afraid of that stuff kind of falling by the wayside. A bill to give local authorities the power to require licences for the conversion of domestic properties into short-term and holiday-let accommodation is making its way through Parliament. It's had its second reading, but that was last December. Since then, progress has been slow and the problem isn't going away. Jeff Moody, GB News. Thank you, Jeff, for helping us understand that. But we're going to have a debate on this. But um, one of our, our guests 
Um, this, is, this is how this um, school thing affects people. Um, he basically uh, brought his kids to school today and found out that they couldn't go to school. Uh -huh. So he's had to go out and collect them again because of the concrete um, situation. So the school was suddenly closed today or closed because of it. So, uh, but we have got Kath Nevin. Uh, Kath is the founder of First Not Second Homes. And after seeing that report, Kath, there basically you would agree with all of that and you, you see the dangers in this and you think, look, it may be convenient, it may be fantastic for some people, but it's, it's not going to solve the uh, the home crisis, is it? Yep, yeah, good morning. Um, no, it's not. And the sad thing is that the uh, alongside the issues that with concrete, with schools, we've got, say, for instance, Polzeth on the north coast, which two summers ago was writing to parents to say we're actually reducing uh, teacher numbers because of, and it's cited specifically because we have a lack of affordable housing, housing for local families. So it, it, you know, infrastructure is being affected and it affects young lives. Young people need stability. They need a home to be able to thrive. And currently we've got 23,000 people in Cornwall alone that don't have that access to safe, secure, affordable housing. Kath, you are speaking to us from Cornwall this morning. How has Airbnb yeah. affected your local area? Um, so the street that I live on uh, in Centre Earth, um, in recent years we've had, as with any population, we've had people moving out. Um, the reasons for sale are many and varied, you know, kind of people passing away. Um, family members need to access those the, the, the funds from those properties. Somebody can't buy someone else out, so inevitably it goes to sale. And the natural thing... With, as with anyone, is that you're going to sell that property for the maximum amount of money. We hear a lot of, about, oh, it's the locals' fault, they're selling it. But if, you're, if you need to access the funds from an inherited property, for instance, you're going to maximise that sale. And currently, the, the, max, you know, the, the way that people are making money out of properties in Cornwall is you get far more money from a short-term let. Now, if we have these regulations where we know how many short-term lets there are, where we know the impact on local infrastructure and, the, and what it's doing to communities in terms of we don't have enough hospital staff here to run the facilities that we need, we don't have enough staff to adequately educate our children, we don't have enough property for people to live in. People are being housed externally. I know they spoke about people not being able to stay in Devon, but the reality is you lose your job, you lose your... Um, the, the children lose the stability, your emotional network, your family. People are being shipped away. Once they get to that other property, it's not a magic, oh, yeah, we'll, we've got somewhere to live and it's all fixed. They've got to start again. And that kind of instability in a young person's life if you want to talk, you know, bring Alex back into the debate, that young person immediately is going through the kind of stress. We all know what, how stressful it is to move. They're going through that stress. Um, they know that their family is stressed. They know their parents are stressed. It, it immediately sets them back for life in some cases. It, it affects their lives for the rest of their life. Well, although you're campaigning, Kath, I'm getting the sense that it's up to a bigger authority than you, a bigger power than you. Someone else has got to step in and say, look, we've got to regulate this because what this woman is, is warning about could see the decimation of whole communities. Absolutely. Um, we have a harsh reality. Uh, the centreforcities.org have done some um, studies. They've uh, The UN have done some some studies recently um, and what they believe is the estimation it would take 442,000 houses being built a year for 25 years to sort the level of housing crisis, the trajectory that we're on, to be able to sort that out over the next 25 years to be able to house everyone adequately and make sure that our communities are continuing to run efficiently but we don't we, we can't build our way out of this crisis basically 
We, we just can't. It's been a creeping problem since 1947. Um, I know that a lot of people talk about in the 1980s and the um, the right to buy scheme being, you know, laying that at that door. But it actually started in 1947 in terms of growth and social housing. The, there was a reduction in growth from 2% to 1.2%. That's almost 50%. We've got a deficit of 4.3 million homes in social housing. Mm. And so we need... That's something we can't just magic that out of the air. It, no amount of um, speedy construction is going to be able to sort that out. So it's a harsh reality. But I would rather, and you can say what you like, but I would rather that harsh reality was that somebody had to make their living from long term letting than somebody went without a home. And that we've got people that have been. I, I know somebody who's been in emergency housing for 18 months, fully qualified mid not, midwife. She can't work because of the situation that she's found herself in. And she's been living in um, charity housing, which she found herself because she doesn't fit the criteria for um, vulnerability in terms of getting to the top of the list. The council wouldn't help her. Um, you know, you look that woman in the face and say, we can't be bothered to find out how many short-term lets there are. We can't be bothered to regulate this industry. Yeah. Kath, thank you for explaining the story so well and putting the other side of the, the coin. Of course, it's a very attractive proposition for a lot of people heading off on a weekend or a holiday or, or whatever, but that is the, the price of an Airbnb. Uh, Kath Navin Thank there, uh, founder of First Not Second Homes. Thanks for explaining that, Kath. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And do let us know, do you use Airbnb or perhaps you live in a, a part of the country like Kath in Cornwall that's been decimated by the use of second homes and Airbnb? You will definitely have an opinion on that. GBviews at gbnews.com. But do stay with us. There's lots more to come, including all of the top stories from the papers with Chris Agabusi and Dawn Newsom, including beach nomads as councils allow hundreds of staff to work from the beaches. That must be nice. That's next. This September, the GB News family is back together from breakfast right across the day, breaking the latest stories and every evening. And don't forget the weekend. We've got the whole of the UK covered. Every week, we'll be hearing your views from up and down the country with fun, lively and intelligent conversation with the biggest guests. This September, we'll meet Chris and John. Thank you for choosing GB News. We're proud to be Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the live desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel. 
like all families, we have arguments every now and then, but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is, and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back. We're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often, they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast, Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Oh, a lot of people have been guilty consciences about uh, Airbnbs. I do. Uh, you don't? No, you do. I do. You do. Now I'm yeah. going next weekend. Yeah. Uh, Julie says she she's an Airbnb user and she says she felt awful when it hit me what we're doing to the residents of villages and beautiful places as well. Um, yeah. Well, it's yeah. fine if you go and treat the place with respect. That's yeah. fine, isn't it? But you can imagine all the groups that go and just. But it's still not getting anybody, you know, she was talking there about um, um, nurses and uh, whatever. Midwives, yeah. Midwives trying to get. Uh, accommodation, long-term rental or whatever, in certain areas. It just doesn't happen. But, I mean, it is scandalous. I mean, basically, our last guest was telling us there's a deficit of four and a half million uh, social houses in this country, a deficit. Four and a half million. That's not going to be fixed overnight, is it? No, it's not going to uh, be fixed with it all going to Airbnb, is it? The rack problem, this is the uh, aerated concrete. Uh, Mark says, uh, where's the money come, coming from to solve this? How about starting by going back to the companies that built the buildings with it? Most of, it will, most of those will be large corporations, make them pay first of all, and then make their shareholders who have profited cough up the money. But the thing is, the, the, the concrete came with a warning that it would last 20, 30 years. Yeah. So why is it their fault? It's, it's governments who didn't replace it. Then take the rest of the money from the foreign aid budget. Then, if there isn't enough, take it from MPs' expenses and wages. I mean, we knew this was going to last 20, 30 years. There's so many questions. We're on 50, 60 years now. How did it get to this point? Oh, I um, did it. Roy makes a very interesting point. Uh, he says the first to notice crumbling, crumbling concrete would be the head teachers. Did they make enough noise about this? Did they tell their borough councils? Did they tell their councils, Lib Dem, Labour and Tory, have they made the education department aware? And then what did the education ministers do? Everyone wants to blame everyone else, but it does start with the school itself. But to be fair to you, Roy, and I've been on, on picket lines with teachers a lot in the past year, they have been making a lot of noise about the state of our schools, especially the state of our school buildings. One of the reasons uh, why they were out on strike in the past year or so. Um, so perhaps they would say they have been making these noises for a very, very long time and they've been ignored. Uh, on this subject, uh, we've got uh, Chris Agabusi, we've got Don Neeson. They've got uh, how the papers are reflecting stories such as this. And Don, uh, we go to The Sun and they have outraged. They have outraged that the Education Secretary, who we are interviewing in the next hour or so, uh, she's been spending money, but not on aerated concrete. What's she been doing? Excellent. You should ask her this question then. Uh, this is page 13 of The Sun today. Uh, school ministers, 34 million on her own headquarters. Uh, Education Secretary Gillian Keegan, she's blown 34 million of our money, remember, taxpayers' money, revamping the offices that she works in. This involves stripping out the 1990s interior over four floors of her department's Westminster HQ. And it's going to focus on sensory, physical, or developmental, developmental, can't talk straight this morning, uh, needs, special needs, basically. It's going to be sort of like a mindful office. But it is actually, it, it, on the face of it, it's, it's, it's a lot of money being spent on the government building, basically, paid for by us. Uh, on the face of it, you think it, it is outrageous when we can't afford to repair our schools. But on the other hand, it's like this is a government building that needs repairing, and we're repairing it. Now, we're talking Does about... Does it need repairing? Well, I mean, according to this, according to the uh, um, home offices, it does. Mm. But um, th that's the big debate, isn't it? So 
on one hand, we're saying, right, we haven't got money to repair our schools, quite rightly so, and they're spending money on this. But on the other hand, this building does need repair and we're spending money on repairing it. So it's, it, there's a two sides to this argument that you can see. It doesn't look good, though, does it? I mean, it doesn't look... It's, it's not reading the room. It's not, not reading the crumbling room, is it? It's no. really not. Um, but they're saying the project was initiated in 2019 and will significantly reduce the annual maintenance costs of the building, which needs repair. But that could do up a, a couple of schools, couldn't it? 34 million. It could, it could certainly do up a lot of schools. But going back but to more the... more important, it could save lives. Well, exactly. It's... it's I, honestly, I still can't get... Ask her, why has this ha taken until now? Yeah, mm -hmm. I will, we'll ask no her about that. No well. one's answered the question, why has it taken until now, like two days before the kids go back to school? Yeah. Um, Keir Starmer, is he answering questions, Chris? Uh, well, front page, The Mirror. Uh, yeah. And he's talking about what is his promise to workers, which is, uh, we're reporting on this, no income tax yeah. rises. So, again, as I said in the last review, this is a very clear election foot in. The uh, ministers are back to work today, and uh, Starmer, Keir Starmer, Keir Starmer's given an interview to the Mirror, and he's no basic rate of income tax. Also, bearing in mind that there's no wealth tax. So, the question that we need to ask around all of this hype and rhetoric is how are you going to fund all of the things that need to be done over your period of government, assuming you get in within the next year? So it's clear he's trying to win the middle ground. He's trying to alleviate any idea that traditional Labour, which is a tax and spend uh, from our own past, we're not going to be anything like that. We're going to be more akin, I suspect, to Blairism than traditional Labour. He's saying in the interview that we've had 13 years of um, Tory austerity uh, kicking off with the global financial crisis in 2008, and we are left with absolutely no money in the coffers. It was interesting to see that he echoes um, Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Trust in the idea that we're going to find money and and and, and raise money, but and um, what's what we're looking for? Um, build the economy. That we're struggling. We're going to strive and build the economy. But again, How? in the piece. How? Thank you very much. How? The devil's in the detail. There is no detail. That's it. So all the rhetoric, no detail, and at some stage as said by um, Jason Beattie, head of politics in the, in the Mirror, at some point we'll have to explain how you rebuild Britain when the coffers are empty. <laughs> We've had Covid spend, we have G yeah. GFC spend, we've got Ukrainian spend, we've given lots of money away over the last 13 years. How are you going to ensure we get it back to do all the things that you want to do in your term of office. Well, mm. you, it's easy. Anybody can cut money. Hardly anybody can generate money. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at things that would, like fracking, like oil drilling or whatever, they seem to be morally done off the table. But exactly that. And it's like, you know, there's another story we, I think Chris wants to discuss as well in the Financial Times about, you know, how closely China and Russia are working together. And if you're talking about energy and ways we can generate money in this country rather than relying on buying stuff in, um, you know, the amount of stuff we buy in from China and Russia, including sort of like energy supplies, it's absolutely terrifying. And it's like we, we don't seem to be... You know, once upon a time, Eamon, we were a country that made things. Mm -hmm. What do we actually make in this country anymore? The service industry, Nothing. Aren't we? I can't think well, of anything. Well, we make Chinese cars and Indian cars and yeah, French true, cars yeah. and but whatever, whatever. Yeah. Um, but, but how, let's, let's develop what Dawn talked about here. We go to the Financial Times for this one, Chris. And Dawn re referenced there how closely China and Russia we're working together, um, and the, these are the, the banks involved. Absolutely, and, you know, again, I think this also shows the demise in Western global... Influences, yeah. Influence mm -hmm. and authority. Mm -hmm. So, whatever side of the fence you are, Russia invades Ukraine, and then the West give this edict. No work with Russia. Right. No so they're hit with sanctions. Absolutely smashed them with sanctions. So the idea is they go broke. Thank you very much. But what did they do? <laughs> now, Russia and Chinese have got two different types of communism, but they go across the border and say, 
Do you fancy working with us? Russia and China go, sure. And so four banks have uh, quadrupled their work with, with Russia. Uh, Russia have got no effect of, uh, of our, um, our side not to work with them. And all of a sudden, Russia no longer have reserves in dollars or euros. All the reserves are set up in, and I didn't know this language before, Remin, Ren, Rem, sorry, Ren, Min B. I'm assuming that's the Chinese currency. Mm -hmm. um, so all of a sudden, all the reserves are in there, and it's business as normal. And we're stuck outside here. We've got energy crisis. We've got cost of living crisis. We've got cra grain and food crisis. And Russia is working along with China hunky dory. So it's a, it, we've basically slapped ourselves in the face, haven't we? We've basically, whether we like it or not, our leaders have given this edict. We are suffering with all the stories we've had today about smelly kids, et cetera, et cetera. We are suffering as a result of the result of our, the dictates from our masters yeah. above and Russia, China, happily. Mm. You remember um, Mr. Trump went, China. 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 <laughs> yeah. He had it right, China. didn't he? He knew that the influence of China across the world... What would... called China flu. Yeah, China, yeah China, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything came from China, yeah, yeah, China. China. And he knew, he knew mm -hmm. that that influence of yeah. that massive area mm -hmm. was going to impact us all. Mm. You know, you were talking about influence and people have an influence on us. If I don't start finding things to laugh at soon, I really am <laughs> going to go. I know, I know. We have to, I mean, even today, laughing at smelly kids, I'm sorry, but we just have to laugh yeah, at them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to find something. There is nothing enjoy. to laugh well, at. And you, the whole idea is that we're made to feel miserable yeah. and angry every day and uh, it brings out the worst One in all of us. One of my favourite books is a by, a by Voltaire called Candide and he travels around the world, the best of all possible worlds, and he ends up coming back after experiencing all of this devastation and, and pestilence and he says, you have to tend your garden. And that was a way of saying, you know what, with all the macro stuff that's going on, what really matters in life is you, your family and your garden. The, the, the intimate yeah, things around yeah, you. Yeah. That's where you find your joy. Interesting. That's where you find I your like happiness. That. Tend your, like garden. That. tend your garden. Tend your garden. I, I tell you what I, I have find... got a garden. What do I do? No, <laughs> see, I find I find now even you can't even watch traditional television because nobody knows what time anything's on at and <laughs> and you know nobody you know what I mean, Dawn. No one sits do. down and says Dallas is on at eight o'clock or whatever it is and, and sit and watch it. You know, it's it doesn't work like well, that. Well that's anymore. my problem with the English Premier League football. Yeah. I, I used to love oh. I used to love oh, well, now, talk Friday about night, what? Saturday, Sunday and Monday yeah. nights, the Premier League. You program. Saturday, Wednesday, you knew you bought your ticket, you're gonna go and watch it, right? Yeah. Boom. Mm. L l lot of unbridled joy. Yeah. But now, like you said, it's all money, over the place. money, 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 money. <laughs> but listen, there's an interesting program I want to tell you about. Um, they're all depressing, all of them. But uh, on Netflix, there's a program called Painkillers. Oh. Painkiller, right? right? Have you started watching it? No, no. not yet. No. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's very, very interesting. It's about a drug. I don't know. It's an opioid. I'm not going to name any drug in case I get it wrong, but it's a, an opioid and it wasn't selling very well. And it's like a lot of the fast food we eat is made to hit your sweet Dopamine spot, and, yeah. right? So it appeals to you that it makes you want more of them. Mm -hmm. It isn't very good for you, but you go yum yum. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So they made this uh, opioid tablet uh, that will not cure your pain, but take your pain away, make you feel relatively happy, but keep you sick enough that you'll need more tablets. Right, right? OK. Absolutely sense. fascinating how big business yeah. works. And advertising is the key. Advertising can lie at anything. And we were talking about this last week. Absolutely. The thing is, burgers always <laughs> amaze me. When you go to queue up or you go through a drive-in or whatever at a burger place, and you see this fantastic, savoury, yes. spongy thing that you want to go, you couldn't, I couldn't even get my mouth round that. <laughs> it's so big and, and spongy. <laughs> and it comes out and it's that. It's, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's wafer thin. Oh, there's no, <laughs> God, no problem with it. So it's lies. Yeah. Advertising is lie after lie after lie. And there is what's called the Advertising Standards Authority and whatever it is, but they still don't stop the lies. Painkiller. Painkiller. I'm going to have to, yeah, on to make a point of watching that one. The trouble is... Doesn't I don't exactly know... sound like it's going to cheer me up, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you I was, laugh, sort of, I was very out. interested in it. I mean, the journalist in me was very interested in yeah. it, but then I'm thinking, this is depressing yeah. me. Yeah. We you know? need some comedy suggestions from... We need some... Well, tell you who I makes me laugh, honestly. There are a number of people that make me laugh. 
Um, oh, too loose me up. Peter Kay. Top okay. of a lot. Yeah, yeah, Peter yeah. Kay. Top bombing. What do you call that lad from uh, East End of London? Uh, of the long oh, hair. Huh? Oh, Russell Brand. No. no. <laughs> uh, long hair. Oh, long I hair. did not know this. Brand, no, hair. no, no, no. He looks like Russell Brand, but he's not. Russell Kane. He's, 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 I think he's a West Ham supporter. Uh, whatever. I know who you mean, yeah. Um... Oh, for goodness sake, Eamon. Nobody's any help to him here, <laughs> anyway. No, well, Russell Brand's a West Ham supporter. Mickey Flanagan. Mickey Flanagan. Mickey Flanagan. Oh, yeah, that was it, yeah. Mickey Flanagan. Yeah. Funny, 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 funny man. I, I like uh, Ricky Gervais, I'm sorry. R I love Ricky Gervais. Yeah. I think he's sarcastically yeah. fantastic. I love normal wisdom. Yeah. Is he still around? Mr. the grip story. <laughs> and he exactly. Wears, he wears a little Rishi Sunak suit. Yeah. Too small Aww. for him. This no is a great style. This is a great style. Frank Spencer. <laughs> Becky. Oh, that's what that, that, that ain't what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a whoopsie in my belly. <laughs> Should we explain for younger oh, viewers yeah. <laughs> what the hell both of you are talking about? Two bodies. <laughs> there we go. There we go. There we go. Let's get them cracking. McIntyre's good. I like Michael McIntyre. I was going to say Michael McIntyre's my choice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's good. I think he's good. funny as well. You and, need a bit of joy. And the Irish comedian, Duran McNally, just to throw a woman in the mix. I was going to say, she's yeah, Irish. we need some women. No, don't, no, don't she's know very, her. like her. Right. She's very good. OK. OK. No, I don't want yeah, she's good. funny. Very, very good. Um, right, let's talk about inventions. Yeah, this might make Chris, so this is in The Guardian. <laughs> and this is people who have patented ideas that they think are going to work in case the rest of us steal them. What are these ideas? Yeah, I, I mean, I... I Initially, when I got given the story, I wasn't quite sure about it, but actually, so it is a very good story. And one of the questions that came out of it for me is, the Guardian analysts found that Winchester had the highest per capita of inventions in 2022. And I wondered, why Winchester? Very and creative, I, Winchester. Very creative. Right, yeah. Well. So, so, and, and I can, yeah, and I'm, well, it's got also it's got a big university there. Yeah. No, not Oxford. Different cathedral. Yeah, it's got a big cathedral. Is there, is there a song? Winchester Cathedral. cathedral. Na, 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 na. Oh my yeah, God, now they're singing, yeah. Ellie. What have we done to deserve this? It's mad. It's not right, is there? Is there a song? Or I just make that up? Yeah, yeah. That's an ace. Thing. That's an easy thing. That's back in the day. Yeah, maybe yeah. it was. Ch the, maybe it was Chichester, <laughs> not Winchester. Maybe it no, was. definitely Winchester because he's okay. Um, but the invention includes, a, for example, a smart part, section in the pathway which alerts you to when a dog's um, poo. Yeah, <laughs> and um, but also then the path itself cleans it up because lots of people no. themselves don't well, do it. That's quite clever. Mm. No, it's not clever. No, that yeah. takes no, no, responsibility, responsibility away from well, owners. You, you, you are aren't right. doing it, are they? People yeah. don't pick up but, but their But in the end, do you, want, do you want us walking dog muckers? But, but then what's to stop humans pooing on the, p the pavement and clearing well, up? Funnily enough, I saw something yesterday where a, a human being was caught defecating in a... Um, where, where, where are we going? Phone booth. Yeah. And the phone oh, was, and no, something that no. was awful. It was awful. Anyway, anyway, uh, but one that I really liked, the, the invention I really liked, was the. the Watching all us, we'd love to listen to you. The so, so, tell so, me we've so, got to go so, to the so, weather so, instead. So, so. But hold, <laughs> hold as that much thought. as we wanted to hear about the <laughs> phone boxes, yes. Here's no. the latest forecast with Jonathan Gauntry. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, a good morning to you. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is set to turn increasingly hot over this coming week with high pressure in charge and we are tapping into air from continental Europe as well, really allowing those temperatures to rise. There is a little bit of mist and fog around first thing this morning, but that will clear off fairly readily and then certainly by late morning afternoon there will be a good chunk of sunshine across the vast majority of the UK. A little breezy around the southwest and gusty along coastlines here and still cloud lingering across the very far north of Scotland, providing certainly a different feel to the day compared to elsewhere where temperatures will be widely in the mid to high 20s. It'll be a fairly fine end to the day as well. Some late sunny intervals before we see clear skies for the vast majority overnight. Probably a reduced chance of fog because the breeze will just be that bit stronger and it will turn quite gusty for the Banai Brikaniog and also Erari. But temperatures generally holding up around 14 to 16 degrees Celsius, so quite a mild warm start to Tuesday morning. Essentially, we do it all again a good amount of sunshine for the vast majority of us. A little bit of higher base cloud wanting to push its way into western England, Wales, Northern Ireland might make the sunshine hazy at times and the clouds still lingering for the Isle of Lewis, parts of Orkney and the Northern Highlands as well. But temperatures up by a few degrees, climbing towards 30 degrees Celsius across parts of southern England. Temperatures looking like they'll peak on Wednesday and Thursday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.
The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Still to come, we'll have more. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Hi, I'm Dan Wooten. You can watch me live on GB News Monday to Thursday from 9pm. And did you know that you can also watch and listen live on our website, gbnews.com. You'll always be up to date on the latest breaking news, as well as enjoying the best stories, opinions and shows. You can even join the debate under our live player as you're watching. So head straight to gbnews.com on TV, radio and online. GB News, Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Schools across Britain could be facing months mm. of closures due to fears over a concrete collapse. Hello there, very good morning to you, 8 o'clock on the dot. It's Monday, the 4th of September. It really is, for me, it was back to school day. Yeah. In my day, it was always sort of 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th of September. But there we are. If you're going back to school, hard luck. Maybe you are lucky. Maybe you're going to school where it's not going to fall down. Uh, you're tuned in to Breakfast on GB News with Eamon and Ellie. Here's what's leading the news this morning. As students across the country are set to return to class this week, the government is under pressure to reveal the exact number of schools at risk of collapse. This, as Jeremy Hunt says, there will be no extra cash for schools affected by the crisis. Elsewhere, as Parliament returns from its six-week recess, the Prime Minister has been warned that it's make or break on small boats as the Home Office recorded the highest daily crossings in the Channel so far this year. Meanwhile, Sir Keir Starmer says there will be no income tax rises if Labour wins power. The Labour leader vowed to kick the economy out of the doom loop of low growth and high taxes. 
And uh, does he mean there'll be no tax rises or just no tax rises for some? Mm. We'll bring you the latest forecast, Jonathan Votre, with that. Temperatures are on the rise this week and we could reach 30 degrees Celsius for the first time since the start of July. Join me later for all the weather details. So here's our top story this morning. The Chancellor of the Exchequer says there will be no extra cash. Well, one minute he says he'll do yeah. everything that it takes to get kids back to school. Then he's saying, well, there's no money to do it. Um, these are schools affected by the concrete crisis with yes. repair costs from uh, the existing uh, budget having to go to pay for anything. Well, Jeremy Hunt's comments come amid a growing demand for ministers to release the full list of buildings affected. Parents are being left in the dark as millions of pupils return to school this week. Bridget Phillipson is the Shadow Education Minister and she says Labour will force a vote. Uh, that will be this week if the government doesn't publish this information, which could be today. We can't be confident that we know the full picture because ministers are refusing to publish the full list of school affected. affected. It's a scandal that parents are being left in the dark just at the point of a new school term starting. Ministers need to be upfront, publish that list and get a grip. We think it's vital that the government publishes the full list of schools affected. They need to get a grip of this situation. But if they refuse to do so, we'll force a vote in the House of Commons this week and make it happen so that parents aren't left in the dark. Well, let's get analysis now. Here's our political editor, Christopher Hope, on this one this morning. Uh, good morning to you, my friend. Uh, back to school. Well, it's back to school, certainly, for the MPs. We're not sure about certain pupils around the land. Christopher. That's right, it's been a six-week break for MPs, but of course many parents are currently buttoning up their children, getting them ready for their, could be their first day back at school, or first day at school as the school term gets underway in England. The problem they've got is this rack, this uh, aerated concrete. Um, there are 22,000 uh, schools in England, uh, Eamon, only 90% of which have returned questionnaires about the, the state of their concrete. Now, we know the early results are that 154 have problems, um, 104 were notified and, and I can't open fully as of Friday, but there could be as many as, well, hundreds more we'll find out, out about over the next few days and weeks. It's a problem at the moment for the government that appears to have no actual end. It started in the 80s and 90s with, with cheaper concrete, or even before that, cheaper concrete being, being used. But where does it end? It's a political um, issue now with Julian Keegan, the Education Secretary, set to give a statement to MPs today. Labour rightly demanding a full list of all the 156 affected. We were promised that on Friday. It hasn't happened yet. No, and it just seems to be a complete mess, to be honest with you, Chris. I mean, we've got Jeremy Hunt speaking uh, to on, on television yeah. yesterday saying he's going to pay whatever it takes, whatever it costs. He's going to make schools safe. But then you've got the Treasury saying yeah. there's no new money. Well, indeed, and, and the government, of course, I mean, Labour, Labour rightly saying it's 13 years of failure. If you want to have an almost a symbol of, of, a, of, a, of a tired and exhausted government, you've got crumbling public buildings. But, of course, the government did cut back on the school's building programme back in 2010 in that word austerity. That was 10 years ago. Since then, we've had a war on. We've had a COVID crisis, other, other drains on public expenditure. But I think, yeah, they've got to get a grip with this, and it's a long-term systemic, systemic problem. I mean, I mean, what would Bridget Phillipson do the Shadow Education Secretary, were she in the DFE? Well, um, we're not, you're not sure yet, but they ought they to find the money somewhere. But today we have Keir Starmer saying there's no more money being raised through any income tax increases. So already Labour is boxing themselves in on what can, they can afford to pay for. OK, Christopher, thank you. We'll leave it there. Chris is our head of politics here at GB News. Well, uh, happy birthday to Google. Uh, Google is the most widely used search engine and it's celebrating its 25th anniversary. So what I'm laughing at is we used to have books before Google came along. Encyclopedias, uh, remember those? Yeah, of course. You know, and that's how, you know, I suppose somebody like myself is how your whole education was. You went to a book. Um, but now you wouldn't even think. Now, now you don't even have to type in anything. You just speak. It's amazing, isn't it? And, and it appears, and it's yeah. there. Um, well, co-funded by university friends Larry Page and Sergey Brin, Google has become an everyday essential in a lot of people's lives. 
But has the search engine got better or worse over the years? And is our data safe under the internet giant? Well, let's ask the futurist and author of The Future of You, Tracy Follows. Well, good morning to you, Tracy. Very, very good to see you this morning. And happy birthday to Google, turning 25 today. And one of the most remarkable things about Google is it hasn't really changed. In 25 years, it is almost the same as it was when it started. Yes, good morning, Ali. Yeah, I think that's right. In terms of like the user experience, when we use it as a search function, which obviously most people do, it's the biggest search uh, function in the world, like 94 billion visits a month, something like that. Um, but I think the company has changed a lot. Even I mean, the company is now known as Alphabet and it has lots more smaller companies, Google just being one of them within the holding company. But the actual user experience hasn't changed that much. Um, I think... You know, there's, there's been changes in advertising. Obviously, lots of the advertising goes through Google and Facebook now. So the, the influence that Google have on what they show you in terms of search results, and obviously the European Union, uh, the Commission has had something to say about the monopoly that Google has on this in the past. You know, that probably has changed. And there's been a debate about what's surfaced through the search results, is it really what we're looking for or is it what Google would like to give us? And I think that's probably one of the debates that's going on today. And how much do you think Google has actually transformed the way that we live? I mean, Eamon just mentioned there, you don't even need to type it in anymore. You can just speak to Google. I mean, it's so intelligent, but for many of us, it's like our right arm. We could, we'd be nowhere without it. That's right. I mean, the more information that you can give to Google, to the search engine that can help optimize the search results, the better the results will be. So, for example, if you can use voice, what uh, Google found was that people would ask longer questions and they'd probably have a location and they'd uh, use other keywords in that request. And so that was giving the search engine more information to optimize and personalize the search results that you would get. And of course, the big move on now, um, and there's a question whether Google missed the boat on promoting this, but the big question now is, will the likes of GPT, ChatGPT, which I know you've heard of and everybody is kind of using and trialing at the moment, these generative pre-trained transformers, as they're called, will that kind of AI replace search? Because one's able to have more of a conversation with that AI and it can take in more training data and it can give you better, more personalized results. And, and that's, I think, the big move on now and the big challenge for Google uh, moving ahead. Yeah. Tracy, well, why does it have to listen to me? Well, well that's the thing I find uh, invasive. I find all of this is very well and good and helpful, but where it crosses the line for me is if I talk about trainers or ties or whatever it is, suddenly all the adverts are there. And then I just get offended to think that that was a small conversation I had with my brother or whatever. Why is it listening to me? That I completely agree, Eamon. There's lots of technology that's uh, listening to us. And we were told many, many times in the past that it wasn't listening to us. I remember when it was found that Apple were listening to your private conversations that you were having with your GP. I don't know if you remember that from a few years ago. That's mm. really shocking to what I try and do um, is go into all of my technology and every time there's an upgrade, I know they're upgrading and signing me up to things that I don't necessarily yeah. want, i.e. Yeah. voice. Like my TV does this to me all the time. Uh, you know, There's a software update. Do the software update. Every time they do it, it opens up the permissions for, the, for it to listen to my voice and every single time I try to go in and close it down. I agree with you. We shouldn't have to do that as consumers. But I think it's it's worth us always being vigilant every time that happens. Every time there's a change, mm. you know, the terms that we sign up to at the beginning allow them to um, update things, and we don't always we all, we don't always yeah. realise. Simply, we could we could opt in rather than uh, opt out of the, of those sort of things. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It, it, I think there's sorry, Ellie. I was just about to say that point of, of vigilance that you just raised, it's a really important one, isn't it? It's a really good message to people because you, you said earlier, the more information you give Google, the better results it can give you. But we do need to be aware of the information that we're giving out to these companies because that is a great concern for people, isn't it? It's data. It is our personal yeah. data and we are just handing it over to, to these companies for free. Yeah, this is the big crossover into the 21st century, the, the move from the industrialised 
uh, sort of organization to information technology. And I would say we're moving from information technology to information biology now. So they're looking at our face, face there's facial recognition, there's biometrics, there's, as Eamon says, voice voice biometrics now. So our biology is now turned into data, and that's information that is, you know, fueling these uh, tech companies now. Tracy, fascinating to talk to you. Goodness knows who was listening to us. Um, but, but thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Tracy Follows is a futurist and author of The Future of You. Thank you very much indeed. The future weather forecast, Jonathan Vautry, with that. Very good. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, a good morning to you. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. It is set to turn increasingly hot over this coming week with high pressure in charge and we are tapping into air from continental Europe as well, really allowing those temperatures to rise. There is a little bit of mist and fog around first thing this morning, but that will clear off fairly readily and then certainly by late morning afternoon there will be a good chunk of sunshine across the vast majority of the UK. A little breezy around the southwest and gusty along coastlines here and still cloud lingering across the very far north of Scotland, providing certainly a different feel to the day compared to elsewhere where temperatures will be widely in the mid to high 20s. It'll be a fairly fine end to the day as well. Some late sunny intervals before we see clear skies for the vast majority overnight. Probably a reduced chance of fog because the breeze will just be that bit stronger and it will turn quite gusty for the Banai Brikai Niog and also Eri. But temperatures generally holding up around 14 to 16 degrees Celsius. So quite a mild warm start to Tuesday morning. Essentially, we do it all again. A good amount of sunshine for the vast majority of us. A little bit of higher base cloud wanting to push its way into western England, Wales, Northern Ireland might make the sunshine hazy at times and the clouds still lingering for the Isle of Lewis, parts of Orkney and the Northern Highlands as well. But temperatures up by a few degrees, climbing towards 30 degrees Celsius across parts of southern England. Temperatures looking like they'll peak on Wednesday and Thursday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Stay with us still to come. We'll be asking, have we become too judgmental about tattoos? We're going to be debating that. That's next. This September, the GB News family is back together from breakfast. Right across the day, breaking the latest stories and every evening. And don't forget the weekend. We've got the whole of the UK covered. Every week, we'll be hearing your views from up and down the country with fun, lively and intelligent conversation with the biggest guests. This September, we'll meet Chris and John. Thank you for choosing GB News. We're proud to be Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <laughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. 
Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel. Like all families, we have arguments every now and then. But actually, we agree on what the mission of GB News is, and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back. We're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often, they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast, Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Good morning, welcome back. The time is 17 minutes past eight and we are asking the question this morning, is society too judgmental of women with tattoos? Well, that's the conclusion of a recent article in the Times newspaper in which writer Porna Bell says there's too much stigma around body art. But we're asking, does she have a point? There's no point having any debate on anything. Just have to accept you can do what you want how you want, when you want, because if you object to anything or raise a concern, where I noticed it was women's football during the World Cup. Oh, yeah. Um, never noticed it that much with women before, but my goodness me, footballers in general, male or female, we're not just talking about one tattoo or five tattoos or whatever, we're talking about body, top to bottom. What, the, the female footballers? Yes. Well, how did I miss that? Oh. Are they all tatted? If they were short sleeves, or you see it on their thighs, or... My colleague, really? will, my colleague will back me up on this, Paul Coit. I will back you up on that. Women's thighs. Yeah, yeah. I think, Ellie, you thought that it was clothing that they were wearing, but they were actually tattoos. That's probably wow. what it was. I, I, I must say that hasn't oh, struck me before. Oh, yeah. mm. Well, last year, a YouGov study found that a quarter of people now have tattoos. That's one in four of us out there. You're welcome to inspect my body from head to foot. <laughs> but no, thanks. <laughs> There's none there, right? Should we judge people for tattoos? Entertainment journalist Sarah Robertson joins us now. She's not a fan. I'm not indeed, Amen. Mm. I think we come into this world beautiful, already masters of art, a masterpiece, with gorgeous skin. And, you know, we've got this lovely blank canvas, beautiful skin. Why would you want to desecrate that and ruin it with, with oh. what really are quite ugly tattoos? Uh, it's like going up to the Mona Lisa yeah. and then drawing a heart on the Mona Lisa's shoulder. And it can you never... You wouldn't ruin a piece yeah. of art, would you? Well, the thing is, we're all different people in our 20s, Ellie, I think, than we are in our 30s, than we are in our 40s and whatever, whatever. And what you may get done in your 30s may not be what you would want done mm in your 60s, and that, I would worry about that, and I'd also worry about pain. Well, it yes. changes as well, doesn't it? I mean, I, I, well, I don't particularly like tattoos anyway, but I couldn't choose something now in my 20s that I know I'd like in my 60s. Exactly. It's a risk, isn't it? And there's a reason why it's called a tramp stamp. That's the nickname oh. given to them. They are just vulgar. They're just not classy things, are they? Well... And you see those neo-Nazis in America and they've got them all over their faces and their well, necks. There, there's and... a man I interviewed once who had his eyeballs, that was his eyeballs, I said, tattooed. Um, so how on earth can you even do that? Exactly, it's disgusting. And it's almost, in a way, it's a quite a cliché, really, saying, oh, I've got a tattoo, because you're trying to sort of join in with your favourite rock star or trying to be rebellious. But who are you actually rebelling against? I just don't understand why well, you'd want to harm I, your I, skin I think, in that way. I think it's up to people if they want it done. I mean, you look at Paul Coit there, you don't know what he's got done and where he's got it done. True. You just don't know to look at. Yeah, you'd never know, would you? It's the quiet ones. My full body inking, you would never have a clue. You'd never have a clue. Here's Tom Crawford, Dr Tom Crawford, who says, uh, no, do not judge people because of these tattoos. And um, to plead your case for us, please, doctor. Hmm. Um, well, I just think... 
people should be judged on their ability to do a job or whatever it is that you are interacting them for the reason you are interacting with them. I think to judge somebody because they have decided to make a personal choice and get a tattoo, I think is incredibly old fashioned and very, very closed minded um, in general. That's what I would say. Doc, could I ask you, because this is my biggest fear, worry, they must hurt. That particularly in sensitive parts of your body, there must be parts of your body that they hurt more than in other parts. Absolutely, yeah. No, I um, I actually have over a hundred different designs across my whole body, and uh, and I can confirm, yes, any anything around the ribs or, or the stomach area is, is um, much more painful than, than uh, say the arms. But wow. that's a form of self harm in my eyes. You are harming your skin, aren't you? What's the difference of that than, than, than taking a knife and drawing it all over your skin? I wouldn't want anybody to interfere with my inner thighs. No, absolutely instance. not. In I other think places. I'd yelp in pain. I'd yelp yes. in pain with that. So is that attractive? Does David Track uh, Beckham stay attractive to you or less attractive because of all of that? I mean, David Beckham is a very, very handsome man, but I have to say the tattoos, there's too many now. They just, mm -hmm. they, they just don't look nice. You think it's like nice. an addiction? It's like a sailor. Yeah, they just look, no, yeah, he just doesn't look nice at all now with them. And it's interesting because Victoria, his wife, she she was going down the road of having quite a few. She's had a lot of hers erased off, lasered she, off. That must be painful too. Well, this is it, you know, so she's caused all that to herself. And Angelina Jolie, for example, who we've just seen, I mean, all of that on the back of her skin with mm. that beautiful dress at an Oscars, it just ruins it. Look at it. It's awful. Doctor, would you accept in any way that addictions could be in play here or people who are making some sort of cry for help? Um, th there's potentially that element to it, but I don't think that that is linked specifically to tattoos. Um, I, I think that will be the case for, for some people, just as it would in any other situation. Um, but I think that's actually, again, quite an old fashioned and sort of closed minded view. And there are lots of recent examples of people telling stories about how they're sort of using tattoos as a way of taking ownership of their body once again and helping them to feel empowered. Taking so ownership. I, I mean, you own your body, you're born into it. What are you taking ownership of? But for some people, um, again, it's, it's not personally a reason why I am tattooed. I, I just find it quite a nice way of self-expression. But I think for some people, it is a way of sort of taking that ownership over their body. It's something they feel they have control over that other people cannot say you can or can't do this. It's something they decide themselves that they want to do. And I, and I think that it is important to remember that people have different reasons for making these decisions to be tattooed. And until you sort of... Oh, no, that's art. Them, I'd get that reasons. done. That oh, Cantona one, I'd get but that done. Can you remember when Cheryl had, I mean, it just looks awful. Can you remember when Cheryl had those awful roses tattooed all over her bottom? Oh, I do remember that, yeah. I do remember that. Oh, that was controversial at the time. Yes. Tom, what, what judgment have you faced, if any, for the tattoos that you've got? So I actually haven't faced anything that I am openly aware of. Um, and I think the fact that I am now teaching maths at the University of Oxford, which is seen, let's say, stereotypically seen as a very traditional role to have. Um, I think that's actually quite powerful for people who have tattoos or are thinking about tattoos to see that it, you, you can still sort of have any job um, in a sense and you can still um, achieve what you want to achieve because society has now moved to a position where we judge people based on their ability to do a job rather than what they look like. And I think tattoos falls into that, that category. But, but, but Tom, Tom, who, Tom like. who did your job? Was it, was it a primary school kid or, or what? It's, a, it's very simplistic, the stuff that you've got. Mm. Uh, well, if, if you saw my back, Eamon, I've got a whole host of cartoon designs and, and uh, different things on my back, which uh, I would argue look incredibly artistic and, uh, and really quite beautiful. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. The ones on my arms are pretty, are pretty um, basic. You know, there's some straight lines and a few. They have mathematical reasons behind them. And it actually leads to really interesting discussions with my students and my colleagues as to they want to know what they mean. And it actually has turned into a teaching tool, which I think enhances my ability to actually teach these students. Well, I mean, I was going to say, is it not distracting them if they're talking about your tattoos rather than the lessons they should be learning? Uh, well, again, a lot of mine are actually mathematical. So, you know, my, my arm over here has quite a lot of numbers and equations on. So uh, they tend to be the ones that they're more interested in as they're already studying maths. So um, it, I actually think it, it does actually lead to some really interesting discussions that go beyond 
um, you know, the stuff they're being taught and actually helps them to learn um, further sort of areas of math. OK. Dr. Tom, you've been, you've been very revealing in more ways than one. He's <laughs> yes. a mathematician at the University of Oxford and uh, obviously a tattoo lover there. Thank you very much indeed for your contribution. Um, Sarah, though, um, you, I mean, whether you like them or not, you've got to accept people's right to do what they want with their body, have you not? You do, yes. And, I mean, I think if they're hidden away and people go into work and they're, they're covered up, but if Tom, for example, starts getting them on his face mm. and where it's visible yes. and then complains to say if he gets turned down for a job, mm -hmm. you can't then expect to, to have a sort of counter-argument so is there, is there a, a, uh, is there tattooism? Can you discriminate against people. Well, I think you can in a you way. Yeah, I mean, yeah. would you feel like, you know, if you were interviewing somebody, you, you would have to be honest to... that they're representing you or your company yes. or whatever it happens to be. And That's I think people it. can only be honest about that as to yes. how they would see. I mean, I think it's like phases you go through, whether it's clothes or haircuts or pop music or whatever. Yes. But you can change all those. You can't really change exactly. the tattoo. That's things. what I would yeah. say. So I think if you're going to have a tattoo and it's discreet and, you know, you're, you can cover up, then fine. You go and do what you want to do. But it's when people start complaining. Yeah. If you could have one, just a little thing, maybe a little <laughs> teaser, something. Is there anything you think, well, I could do that? I mean, I have to admit, I think about it and say, what could, would you put on? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want. I don't want one. Do you want know what? One. Have Man you no, there. No. No. Oh no! no. Awful. Can no. you remember when? Can you remember when Johnny Depp had Winona forever, and then when oh, they split up, he had to have yeah. Why No, yeah. Why No forever, so he had what? to have the. Sarah, I can imagine you with a little crown or something, though. A little, a little crown. A little royal crown. A tiara. Queen little... Sarah. Yes, yeah, uh -huh. something Sarah, like that would be nice. Do you nice think? Do you think that would be nice? I okay. am interested, though. Do you? Did you feel like Tom <laughs> broke the mould there or broke stigma at all? Because he's a professor at the University of Oxford. Yes, I have to say. You, but you, don't, you don't expect that. But, I mean, I was at a wedding a few years ago and there was a surgeon there who was covered with tattoos as well. Really? And, so, and she had bright pink hair. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, that was the last thing I was expecting her to say, that she was a, she was a surgeon at yes, a hospital. Yes, yes, yes. So I suppose it does challenge stereotypes, doesn't mm -hmm. it, when you see, see people like that. But... Well, here we are. <laughs> uh, Dave says, oh. I've just turned 62 years of age and my daughter and I got a tattoo together. Oh, okay. I have never had a tattoo. To. However, I now have a Scottish thistle on my left arm. Well, it's better than putting it on your bum. Might be, <laughs> might be a bit prickly to sit he, on. If he gets sick of it, he can't see it on his yeah. bum, can he? Maybe that's why Cheryl had it done on her bum, because she yeah. thought, well, I can't you see it. You can just if ignore it. Yeah. yeah, ignore it then. If it's on your arm, you have okay. to sort of see it a bit more, don't but, you? But yeah. he goes on to say people who hate tattoos are narrow-minded, Sarah. Oh, OK, then, right. What do you say to uh, that? Well, I don't think I'm narrow-minded. And you've got very delicate, fair skin as well. Exactly. I, can sort of see, I don't see, want to desecrate it with horrible right, I can, I can see the, I could, things. Uh, yeah, I could think it'd be painful. And also, I think it's germs. And you never know, do you, if you go into a tattoo parlour? You don't always 100% know that they're actually clean. Well, yeah. Paul, yeah. Dave is old. Paul says, but what about if you get them young and you get old? That's the worst thing about you them. You get the saggy skin. Yeah. yeah. You Listen know, this, things don't stay in the same place, yeah. do they? Dave when you're says, young. we saw an elderly lady with an Elvis tattoo on her back. Safe to say it's now a very wrinkly Elvis. And they fade as well. And yeah. the colours that you get don't look the same at the end of the mm -hmm. end of the day. So yeah. I think it's one, if you go in, you have to go in knowing that it's not going to look like that in 20 years and you're not going to be the same person in 20 mm. years as no. what you are when okay. you first get them. Or if you get someone's name tattooed, um, like what Johnny Depp did, and you're not going to stay with no, them. No, well, <laughs> well, she is Sarah Robertson and she is tattoo free. Yes. Okay? Yes. Proudly so. Proudly so. <laughs> Any bits of her that I've seen today, oh. I can verify that. Exactly. There's certainly nothing, nothing there. Nothing on show. <laughs> Only thank jewelry you. that adorns Thank you very much skin. indeed, Sarah. <laughs> thank, thank you, Sarah. Thank, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Well, oh boy, have you got any tattoos? No, but I was at when I was at school yep. in a TD class, yep. technical drawing. There was a kid, I swear this is true, there was a kid that was sitting behind me. And you remember the old compasses, you know, the yep. compass? He had a compass oh, no. and he broke a pen in half. Yeah. And he was tattooing love and this is a lovely school I went to. Love and I, hate. Love and hate, and he got the E the wrong way around. And I've never seen him since. I always wonder whether all these years on 
whether that love and hate is still there. But compass, probably not advised. Probably not advised. That's got to hurt. I mean, really hurt. And, mm. uh, and, he, and he failed his technical drawing test oh, that day wow. as well. He failed it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. he should have been concentrating more on his technical drawing. It put me his... off as well, because I failed as well, because I kept looking <laughs> over my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was um, the most awful thing I've ever seen. Uh, I don't know if I'm on football or off football at the moment. The Premier League results yesterday, Paul. Yes. Um, so you had big games. You had uh, Palace. Uh, beating Wolves yeah, uh, at home. There was, yeah, a lot of goals. Um, a lot of goals. Liverpool beating Villa 3 0 at Anfield. And, 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 most, game. and, and Salah, is he going to stay there, do you think? I think eventually he will go. I think he'll be there for the time being. Yeah. But uh, I think eventually he will go over for the Saudi money, but I don't think it's going to happen. I thought Jurgen Klopp's been talking very confidently about retaining him. Yeah, and he's got to. And also, it's really important that he does stay, as far as Klopp's concerned, because, of course, the transfer window's yeah. closed. Yeah, but he's not far, in Saudi Arabia. Not in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I'm amazed they've actually got a transfer window at all. I think they'd be mm. able to do whatever they want, whenever they want. Declan, they Rice, Declan Rice has proved he's been a good buy for Arsenal. He scored yeah. um, yesterday. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was a bit painful to watch, wasn't it, for you and it for Spurs it fans it's as well? And people people don't um, realise, unless you're someone like yourself, Yeah. Do you follow football, Ellie? I do, yes. Yeah, Spurs, sorry. You're a Spurs fan? Yeah, I'm with I'm on this one. Yeah. Sorry. Good, good football they're paying. Uh, you know, I think they have a good manager on board there, whatever. But um, I, I just... Um, it's, it's, it was hurtful yesterday. It was hurtful. Yeah, it is going to be... We, we moved from, a, from, a, from a second of winning the whole game to then pay, playing seven and a half hours of extra time. Ooh. And, uh, and losing it. How, how do you react? Are you a real that. shouter? Do you because I absolutely lose it. You you were and texting that, the joy. me. You were texting me. I was. And, and you were, you were sympathetic to me because you're a, you're a Spurs fan and that that was your North London rivals. I'm really not in the mood to talk to anybody. I'm on a WhatsApp group as I'm, oh, as, well, as I'm watching yeah. as well. But I and and then it just. I didn't watch any of the post-match analysis or whatever. Turned the telly off and I tried to sleep, Aww. thinking oh, when no. I woke up it would just have been a horrible dream. Closure. That's why I'm mm. here, so we can talk about it. Yeah. And it's just closure. Then you can move on. Mm. You know, do you get away. Up, do you get upset? Yes, I was upset. Did it upset you the rest of the day? Yes. Aww. I was upset. Upset my sleep last night. It was upset <gasps> me this morning. Oh dear. Um, and I think it was unjust. And I think, I think there are problems. And I think. Um, I, I don't wish to be critical of the manager or whatever, but there's selection choices, there are formation choices, tactical problems, there are various things. Uh, Man United in the transfer market. You know. Jaden Sancho, you know, we've got problems with Jaden Sancho. He got Alango, sc Alango scoring for Forrest at the weekend. It's always going to hurt. Not good enough hurt. for us, but great for Forrest, you know. It's... I'll tell you what I do have for you, though. I don't know if you're interested. Do you, I've got a couple of um, football tattoos. If you're interested in those, oh Would yeah, you be interested I'll see in that. those. We, we talked about Spurs. Um, some of the great tattoos. Uh, we've already spoken about some of the women, but Richarlison with one of the great tattoos. Look, have, there we are. There's Richarlison playing for Spurs. Have a look at his oh, back. Oh, it's his neck. See if you can recognise who's on his back. Well, there we are. It's like get off my back now. Ronaldo is apparently the one on the left. I'm not really sure how much it looks like Ronaldo. This is Wayne Rooney. It does look more like Wayne Rooney than does Ronaldo. There's Neymar on the right, and on the back, in the middle, is Peter a tattoo Schmeichel. of himself. I was about to say, that's him, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So there's a tattoo of himself on his back. Oh, no, you can't which is do one that. There. Nicholas Otamendi, uh, Man City legend, he's got his favourite TV shows <gasps> actually tattooed on his back. Which would be what? Well, I, 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 there we are. Have a look at those. There we are. I don't well, think he's... He just looks like an armed robber. robber. He's got he prison does. break on Prison his break back. is one. He's got Peaky Blinders. He's no. got Tommy Shelby from Peaky Blinders. No, um, no, no. He's also got Walter White from Breaking Bad. I would, have, well. I would have Top Cat on there. I'd have Why <laughs> Don't You <laughs> on the back here. <laughs> Why don't you just go away and stop annoying us on a Saturday morning or whatever? Across my shoulders, I'd yeah. Leslie Judge, Peter Purvis and John Noakes. <laughs> Can you imagine? The Holy Trinity of <laughs> Holy TV. Trinity. I'd have Captain Scarlet, <laughs> Colonel White... Yeah, no, but and people would think you're an Black. Arsenal fan if you're Captain <laughs> Scarlet because they'd think it was Mikel Arteta on the back. Do, 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 I, got, do. I got one more. I got another one. I got one more for you. Yeah. Um, Amato Ciccaretti. Now, I, don't, I think this is... This an Italian journeyman, um, he's actually got the his Twitter handle, which is tattoo, which he has no. a tattoo. I know it's crazy. Look at this. So I don't know why. You, is it because he can't remember? And see, also the fact it should be now X Twitter's instead not of the Twitter. Twitter anymore. Twitter's X. I know. No. So it's how do you function. actually put an X through that? It's out of date already. I know. 
See, there you go. Oh, there's the argument. What the do point? you do? I'll have to have that removed now. Anyway, yeah. anyway, uh, we're going to be talking to the Education Secretary about what is going on at schools, uh, when did they know about this whole uh, concrete defect, and uh, the newspapers with Chris Sakabusi and Don Neeson right after this. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6 is Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Hi, I'm Dan Wooten. You can watch me live on GB News Monday to Thursday from 9pm. And did you know that you can also watch and listen live on our website, gbnews.com. You'll always be up to date on the latest breaking news, as well as enjoying the best stories, opinions and shows. You can even join the debate under our live player as you're watching. So head straight to gbnews.com on TV, radio and online. GB News, Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Good morning, it's paper time and it's 8.39 and joining us to go through the papers this morning is Olympian Chris Akabusi and former editor of the Daily Star, Dawn Neeson. Very good to see you both this morning. Do you want to tell us? Do you want to tell us? <laughs> Do, you? Do you want to? You don't have to. What? About tattoos? Yeah. Well, I wasn't asking on the debate, so yeah, I've got a tattoo. How big? How small? All over my back. All Ooh, over your uh -huh, back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And have you ever had a chance to... Regret it? Not at all. I love it. You love it? I'd still have more. Would you? Yeah. And why would you say, I would still have more, meaning you're not... I'm having... running out of... I agree with Sarah to a certain extent that 
public skin is a, uh, not my thing. So, so you're uh, running out of private skin. Yes, exactly that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> uh, Chris, you were in the army. A big, big uh, influence there, I would imagine, to get tattoos. A lot of guys would have got tattoos and girls. No. So, so I mean, t today's army, yes. Back in the day, no. no. I mean, no, no because <coughs> excuse me. I mean, you couldn't display. You could, there's uniformity. Was everything. Yeah. Mm. So the idea that you know you'd go for the ranks and some would have a tattoo. But sailors would get them. I really can't answer for, for sailors. I, mm. I just know in the army there was no way that you'd have it. But, but today, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm going back to the army camps all the time now, and um, for nostalgic reasons, and I see soldiers with tattoos all over the place. But you're not tatted. Oh, not a prayer. That's Why? A... Oh, not a prayer. Not I mean, for you. No, I, I mean, I, I just, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I like a man with a tattoo. I find it quite hot. OK, well, I'm obviously not hot enough for you, tattoos. baby. Yeah, uh, yeah. when, no, we, when, we, when, when we got engaged, oh. rather than getting him a, a ring or anything like that, he had my name tattooed on his arm. That was 40 years ago, so yeah. it was worth doing. And then, did that make your heart flutter? Not these days, no. Oh. <laughs> what, could you, what could you change Dawn into if you two hadn't have been... Oh, God. Dawn. Okay. Well, Dawn could be a sunrise as well. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah, that's right, a bit of a sun. Good idea, go. good idea. <laughs> talking about sun, Chris, yes. um, the Daily Mirror, talking about um, summer has arrived. Very Just good, the sun very good. Never! Mm. And it's great. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we had a great day yesterday. <laughs> when the sun was out on the golf course, it was beautiful. And it's a great picture in the Daily Mirror. Better late than never, summer holidays. Uh, may even hit 30 degrees later on this week. And, of course, what's happened this week? All the children are back at school when they could have been in the garden, could have been having barbecues, yeah. could have been at the yeah. beach, could have been just enjoying themselves at sports in the venues, and then the sun comes out. So it's better late than never. Hopefully it's still around for next weekend. Well, according to the Daily Star's front page, it's going to last until Halloween. Ooh, well, that would be nice, wouldn't it? That's a long stretch, That's isn't a long it? I'll cope. I'll no, we'll yeah. be fine with that. I'll womanfully yeah. cope with that one, Eamon, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, you know, we all feel better when the sun comes out. Yeah. Oh, That's schools. what's called an Indian summer, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yes, definitely, an Indian yeah. summer. Yeah. And how beautiful was that sunset last night? Did we, ca did we catch that? It was oh, so yes. And yeah. orange. And... Yeah, because I, I got the mm. reflection of it on the buildings, the tower blocks opposite. Beautiful. Just right. Right. more oh, yeah, of yeah, that, no, please. Did. Again, you saw, didn't you do a... a uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It's probably boring. I do that every day. Don, here's a story in the mail. It's front page of the mail. Councils allow staff to work from the beach, they're saying. Um, it's a tenfold rise in the number of local authorities um, who allow their employees to log on from wherever they want to their day jobs. This is, this is such a typical Daily Mail story. Mm -hmm. uh, they, do, they do this so well. It's one of those headlines where, especially as a lot of people are heading back to work and school mm -hmm. today, obviously, um, after the summer holidays again. Oh, my God, how dare they? They're working from beaches. But, um, basically, it's a freedom of information request. Town hall bosses have granted more than 1,350 requests to work from overseas, right? So not just working from home. These include um, people who are working for UK companies from Spain, Australia, Dubai... Brazil, India, Italy, France, Thailand, uh, Costa Rica, South Africa, I mean, all over the world, basically. So it sounds horrible, right? All of these people working from beaches, how much can they concentrate, etc., etc. There's going to be so many distractions. But when you drill down into it, as I want to do, this is only 1,350 people working for local councils, right? There are 2.24 million people who work for local councils. It's a tiny percentage of people who are actually yeah. working but from But I'd still each. feel envious of anybody who does. So would I, do, I just cannot... But could you trust yourself, Abe, nope. to not get distracted? No. Nope. No, exactly well, that. Absolutely. <laughs> and, I mean, I can only speak of my own, my own situation. Um, there would be too much of the dog, the Amazon man arriving at the front door. Exactly. Uh, the fact, oh, I think I'll nip down and get something from the butchers yep. for dinner mm -hmm. tonight, whatever. Mm -hmm. There's too much risk and yep. temptation of looking after yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than looking after your business, yeah. but, but also, I, yeah, I said, I think it is also disingenuous because many companies have what's called EMEA, EU, Middle East, and, and, and Africa. They might be just calling in naturally to head, to head office in the UK. Um, you could be on a team's call, for example, and have just come in off the beach for a team call. You could be managing your direct direct uh, line below. So, there are many, many reasons why you could legitimately be on a holiday over the last six weeks mm. and calling into the office 
extra time and not necessarily being paid for it. You know, so... I would do that all the time. I, yeah. I well, work constantly. So, but but that's, but that's all counted in these numbers. So, you know, you could be away, or for example... But these aren't people look, on holiday. These are working. They're meant to be working well, yeah, work but, time. Well, uh, is it? No, yeah. I'm not... Is yeah. it? So, so it's not like you, for example, being away and finding out, oh, you're going to be on GB News on Monday saying, oh, what, what, what are the issues for me to... No, 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 no. These, these are people that are meant yeah. to be working. They're, They're working full-time, nine to five. Yeah. Can you work yeah. from the beach, do you reckon? Do you think you'd be productive? Mm. So, Chris, this would be like you and I on the golf course, not that that's going to happen in my case, but, like, Citri doing this paper review from a golf course. But, you see, there are certain things... You could do this newspaper <laughs> review from, from, from most places, from anywhere, yeah. on a Zoom or whatever it is, but that's not the point. What we're saying is a dedicated... If you had to do seven and a half hours, eight hours a day at an office working for an insurance company or the passport yeah. office mm -hmm. or yeah. the driving yeah. licence office or whatever it is, you... We all think that you should be dedicated to that job and have no distractions. Exactly. That would, that think we're no, all no, of course, I, mean, I, I, know, I would agree with that. I mean, there, there, yeah. And there's so much more going on when you're at work than the actual nuts mm -hmm. and bolts exactly. of the job. Exactly, it's learning. There's information and, yeah. transfer, there's mentoring. Yeah, and social you know. skills. Um, well, one of the um, companies that are mm -hmm. urging people to get back to the office is, is Zoom. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh dear. What's the irony in that? Exactly. Mm. I hate um, of course. Well, we haven't got time for all of them, but the I are printing 50 questions that the Prime Minister has to answer before an election, but he dodges them. But yeah, he and, 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 and I, actually, I loved, I'd love this, but three that could appeal to both sides of the divide, so not just um, Sunak, but also Sir, uh, uh, Keir Starmer. Um, will you extend the 2030 deadline for the ban on sales of diesel and petrol cars? It's only seven years away. And, and he, he can't he, answer it. No, he can't. Well, he, he, he won't answer it. But, but he should answer it, but he won't answer it. And neither will the opposition leader. Um, can you guarantee the pension age will not be raised again? We've got an age of population. See, let, let me ask you all. Politicians are afraid of answering questions in case it's held against them. Am I alone in thinking that I would be forgiven if someone said, look, Eamon, I don't have the answer to that. I only came into this job two months ago and I wasn't told about this, which is the sort of question I'm going to ask the Education Secretary very shortly about when she knew about the concrete situation. But why can't you just sort of say, nobody told me about it and I'll, I'll get you an answer this time tomorrow You're or whatever? You're expecting... Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I would have much more respect for any politician I was interviewing if they just turned around and said... I'm really sorry, rather than sort of like tap dance through it and fudge it, I just don't have the answer to that one, but I will get back to you. I'd respect someone for that. Isn't that just such a normal person response, though? Yeah, we're too normal. Yeah, yeah. But then, yeah. Then, maybe but that's then our you, problem. You, you still accuse them of dodging the issue because actually, if it's uncomfortable, maybe you're still accepting responsibility. No, no, I don't think you would. I think they've then got to face the party machine and what the line for the party yeah. is, or whatever. For instance, I think the Chancellor either looks stupid or as if he tells fibs when yesterday he went on TV to say, we'll spend what it takes to fix unsafe schools. But <laughs> then they're not going to spend what it takes. They're not. It no, comes out of existing money. budgets. There's no money. Mm -hmm. So that's a lie. Yeah, but you know, politicians are economical with the actuality. But that's a lie. It's just, I'm sorry, why can't you say the country's broke, we haven't got the money, we're going to have to do something drastic, so we either do without public swimming pools and fix the schools, well, or... I, I, well, no, I, what, what, I mean, we have got the money when we want to. Because we've got the money for Ukraine, we've got, we've got the money for... Political... political. So, 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 yeah, if it's political expedient, mm. then we will have the money. That's, that's why people are agitating for rises in wages, because we know you don't care about me, but when you've got something for yourself, you'll go for it. But one of the questions I wanted to say that is appropriate to both... Does the fall in donations to the Conservative Party show you are already lost the confidence of business and the next election? Because can you do you want to appeal to the blue wall or do you want to appeal to the red wall? You can't appeal to both. You know, you can't have served two masters. And both, you know, both of these guys are trying to appeal to everybody and say, everybody vote for me. And again, it's, it's a people... We lie. We lie. We try to... Pretend. No, we've got to be able to say, this is our segment of the community that we're going for. But we didn't do that, so we tried to do sweeping stuff and appeal to everybody. I, I think they, they either lie or they're stupid or they think we're stupid. They think we're stupid. Mm. They, they do. Um, um, talking about, um, John, today in The Times, 
Um, it spells today, this particular day, the uh, what is it, the fourth of September. September. Uh, spells trouble for couples. Yeah, be afraid, be very afraid. The first Monday of September um, is when most people uh, seek couples therapy or even go to see divorce lawyers. Mm. Now, the thinking behind this is that it's the end of the summer holidays. You've spent that long hot summer or cold summer in our case uh, with your other half and the kids, and you're thinking, I can't do this anymore. So you get back to normality and you think, right, we've got to do something about it. So we either go and have therapy or we get a divorce. Not a good, not a happy Didn't we day. get a lot of training for that with, with lockdowns and stuff where you had to live with your partner for a considerable period of time and got nothing else but them in the four walls? Yeah, well, that, I think that probably happened a lot after lockdown as well. And the other dangerous period is straight after the uh, Christmas New Year break as well. I was about to say, it sounds like January. They've got the blue, is it Blue Monday? Blue, yeah, Blue Monday, January? the same And it the rolls same thing. around, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. In September. And the, the other thinking behind it is that obviously you don't want to upset kids or elderly relatives during the, the holidays by announcing you've got marital problems and getting divorced, so you do wait until September when things back Let me ask you things. We live in an age where... I, I hate it when you go, let me ask you, <laughs> what's he going to say now? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to say. You, you turn on your Instagram or whatever and you get all these lovely thoughts which say, empower, do whatever suits you, do whatever makes you happy. And you have to realise that nobody wants you to be happy. You have to suit other people. That's true. It's true, they say, do what suits you. So say it suited you yeah. to walk away from your husband, right? I'm not suggesting, I'm just saying, say it suited you. But it wouldn't suit him, it mightn't suit his family, it doesn't suit your neighbours. You met my husband's family, any <laughs> chance. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, everybody has an opinion. It's not about do what makes you happy, Chris. Mm. I'm saying it's very hard to do mm. what makes you happy. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's been an atomization of society and the individualization over cohesive the nature of society. So, is that posh way of being selfish? Well, I, I guess so. But we have been inducted into selfishness, yeah. haven't we? That's what you I know, we, you know, we've got the power shoulders of the '80s and. Uh, upperly mobile people and the atomization of the family where you've got double income in families, go get what you want. You know, it's, it's your right to be happy and to do what you want. And unfortunately, it's now embedded deeply inside each and every one of us that my life, my body, my way. Do you think that's why the divorce rate is so high? It's well, about that's 48% in this country. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's because we all focus too much on ourselves and not anymore as a, as a couple, as a unit? Well, with that shadow of a doubt, yeah. I mean, marriage is, it, marriage is not the beacon for us all to follow any longer. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we do look and we're happy for you know, women to be in powerful positions at work and, and dedicate themselves to work. We're happy for all of us to have the nice car and have the nice holiday. And that seems the thing that we are actually going for, as opposed to, you know, um, and so apple pie and crumble and cream and sitting around a nice house with a picket fence and 2.4 kids which used to be the thing that we were all striving for. So when you left school, you knew straight away you had to go and get married and go... So get a job first and go and get married and start a family. Well, what, what youngster now in 20, 22, 23, would ever think about getting married and having a family? That's somewhere down the road, mm. if at all. So it's just different values to different ways of operating. There we are. Those are the, the wise words to dwell on and think on from our pastor today. <laughs> Chris, Chris that was, that's, that's very good. It's very good. <laughs> Thank but, you, sir. But um, whether you agree, whether you disagree... Fire and brimstone this morning. <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to break off, cos we've got to bring you the weather, and it is going to be a good week, and then we'll go uh, to the school's education minister very, very shortly. Uh, Chris, Don, thank you both thank very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go to Jonathan. He's got the weather picture. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, good morning to you. I'm Jonathan Vautry, here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. 
It is set to turn increasingly hot over this coming week with high pressure in charge and we are tapping into air from continental Europe as well, really allowing those temperatures to rise. There is a little bit of mist and fog around first thing this morning, but that will clear off fairly readily and then certainly by late morning afternoon there will be a good chunk of sunshine across the vast majority of the UK. A little breezy around the southwest and gusty along coastlines here and still cloud lingering across the very far north of Scotland providing certainly a different feel to the day compared to elsewhere where temperatures will be widely in the mid to high 20s. It'll be a fairly fine end to the day as well. Some late sunny intervals before we see clear skies for the vast majority overnight. Probably a reduced chance of fog because the breeze will just be that bit stronger and it will turn quite gusty for the Banai Brikai Niog and also Erari. But temperatures generally holding up around 14 to 16 degrees Celsius, so quite a mild warm start to Tuesday morning. Essentially, we do it all again. A good amount of sunshine for the vast majority of us. A little bit of higher base cloud wanting to push its way into western England, Wales, Northern Ireland might make the sunshine hazy at times and the clouds still lingering for the Isle of Lewis, parts of Orkney and the Northern Highlands as well. But temperatures up by a few degrees, climbing towards 30 degrees Celsius across parts of southern England. Temperatures looking like they'll peak on Wednesday and Thursday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. This September, the GB News family is back together from breakfast. Right across the day, breaking the latest stories and every evening. And don't forget the weekend. We've got the whole of the UK covered. Every week, we'll be hearing your views from up and down the country with fun, lively and intelligent conversation with the biggest guests. This September, we'll meet Chris and John. Thank you for choosing GB News. We're proud to be Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the live desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes & Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows... Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back, we're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast, Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching.
We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. G. Schools across Britain could be facing months of closures due to fears over a concrete collapse. Uh, hello there, very good morning to you. Nine o'clock is the time. It's a Monday morning, the 4th of September. Breakfast in GB News served up by Eamon and Ellie. Here's what's leading the news this morning. As students across the country are set to return to class this week, the government is under pressure to reveal the exact number of schools at risk of collapse. This, as Jeremy Hunt says, there will be no extra cash for schools affected by the crisis. Elsewhere, as Parliament returns from a six-week recess, the Prime Minister has been warned that it's make or break on small boats, as the Home Office has recorded the highest daily number of crossings in the Channel so far. Meanwhile, Sir Keir Starmer says there will be no income tax rises if Labour wins power. The Labour leader vowed to kick the economy out of the doom loop of low growth and high taxes. And uh, the forecast, because it's going to be a good one this week, Jonathan Vautry with that. Temperatures are on the rise this week and we could reach 30 degrees Celsius for the first time since the start of July. Join me later for all the weather details. So to our top story this morning, the Chancellor says there will be no extra cash for schools affected by the concrete crisis, uh, despite on the BBC yesterday uh, saying he would not speculate on the potential cost of fixing the problem, but said we will spend what it takes to make sure children can go to school safely, well, except they won't. Well, yeah. Because, because it has to come out of existing budgets. Yeah, the Treasury says there's going to be no more money. But Jeremy Hunt's comments come amid a growing demand for ministers to release the full list of buildings affected. Because as you said earlier, it's not just schools, is it? It's police stations, it's hospitals, it's public buildings. Uh, but in the meantime, parents are being left in the dark as millions of pupils return to school this week. Are you going to hear now from the Shadow Education Minister, that's Bridget Phillipson. And she said Labour are going to force a vote this week if that information is not published. We can't be confident that we know the full picture because ministers are refusing to publish the full list of school affected. affected. It's a scandal that parents are being left in the dark just at the point of the new school term starting. Ministers need to be upfront, publish that list and get a grip. We think it's vital that the government publishes the full list of schools affected. They need to get a grip of this situation. But if they refuse to do so, we'll force a vote in the House of Commons this week and make it happen so that parents aren't left in the dark. As you can imagine, the Education Secretary very busy uh, today. We have got her lined up to speak to her anytime shortly. Uh, and in the meantime, we're going to preview what uh, Andrew Pierce is talking about come half past nine. Andrew. Well, we're obviously going to talk a lot about schools. Mm. Uh, it's a huge story, isn't it, for parents. Uh, here we go again, the nightmare of home tuition. Kids back in lockdown, uh, and some talk some of these schools could be shut down or partially shut down till December. Mm. Extraordinary. And Andrew, it sounds calamitous. I mean, yeah. we had a guest on this morning who said he took his kids to school this morning, had to turn back around and go back home. It, it, and how it could have taken until the end of last week for them to realise there was a problem when this has been around for months and months and months. In fact, Ellie, it was identified, first identified in 1999. It's been around for a very long time. So kids, as ever, being let down. And um, if you're a mum or a dad, it must be a nightmare thinking, but, Andrew, the, the thing that makes me really despondent is you can identify we've got a, an emergency, and an yeah. emergency means dealing with something here and now and making sure it doesn't become catastrophic. And yet the government do not have a penny to pay yeah. towards this. They're basically saying, yes, we'll sort this, meaning they won't sort it. What they're saying is they're going back to headmasters and mistresses and saying, now, all that money you had for classroom assistance and school trips and whatever it is, you use that to pay for keeping uh, the roof up. It's extraordinary. And, and of course, it's not just schools either, because it's going to be hospitals and police stations and other public... Yeah. Extraordinary story in one of the papers today about one hospital, they haven't named it, where 
obese people are not allowed on a certain floor yes. in case they come piling. So, so I'm in trouble. <laughs> <If you're, laughs> I don't think you. I think you hey, feel right. Stop. They're talking about people 19, 20 stone. I don't think that's you. Amy. <laughs> no. They weigh you. They weigh you I'm to a, see what, what, what you're going to be. What sort of is that to And then you may be a danger to the roof <laughs> and all living occupants. I mean, we're laughing, inside. but it's but it's it's a joke, isn't it? It is. But if it wasn't that, so serious, I know. If it wasn't so serious, and we have the chance of doing the beat the media round yesterday, say we'll do every, all it takes. And then the Treasury have to ring round and clarify yeah. what he meant was no yeah. money. Yeah. I, I just, it's not I, good. I, it's a mess. And they're back in, in Westminster this week, MPs, and it's, it's the big story, of course. And also we're going to be talking about migrants. Record number again at the weekend. It's a not busy in well, tray, is it? isn't it, for Rishi Sunak on his first day back? Certainly. Well, he'll say he's been at it the whole summer, of course, but first day back in school. Mm. Me too. Well, Andrew, lots to look forward to in your programme. Okay. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to that one, aren't we? Uh, um, we lots... know. Well, what, 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 what do you think to say? Well, lots of people getting in touch as well. You've okay. got lots of people talking uh, about about painkillers. Anne wanted to know about oh, that. No, no, the reason we're talking about painkillers is a series on Netflix called Painkiller. I think it's Pain called, called Painkiller. Pain and, um, and there's another one on another channel. Which one's that one? Robert says he's, he's watching a series on Disney Plus called Dope Stick, which is about painkillers. It's very shocking, he says, about how pharmaceutical companies work, which yeah. is exactly what you're saying. So these two stories are more or less the same, and they're about painkillers and how they get you addicted to them and how they get doctors to sell them and they give doctors golfing holidays and things if they push these prescriptions uh, your way. And they basically are opioids that get you, make you feel very nice, get you quite addicted but don't cure you so they mean you come back for more and you come back for more it's really quite quite disturbing to see yeah i bet it is yeah mm. yeah um so i've got people talking this morning um and we've also been talking about some of the best comedians in the country this morning why are we talking about that don't know how we got on i that. brought it up <laughs> so, well, so we, th we need things to make us smile it's struck a, to make it's us struck laugh. a chord with so many of you bob says yeah. you need to give uh, sarah millican a shout she's the funniest person on tv since billy Connolly. And Esther says, thank you so much for your morning section just before 8 o'clock this morning. You've made me laugh out loud, Eamon and Ellie. What a great start to the week. Thank you. Now, uh, great start uh, is needed for the gentleman who joins us um, now uh, beside us. And he is Tim Franklin. And uh, I don't, where are we going now? Sorry, we've got something mixed up here. Right, there it is here, Tim Franklin. And uh, Tim, let me tell you about Tim. Tim has spent most of the year um, changing his whole lifestyle and he began running. And he found that his diet started improving, he was losing weight, he even noticed a massive improvement in his mood. Yes, and it changed his life so much that he's put everything on hold to run around the entire world. Yes, you heard that right. By May next year, his aim is to cover 26,232 kilometres across five continents and 23 countries. Well, you never guess. He's running around London and we said, come into the studio, basically. And uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to hear from Tim. Very nice to see you. Lovely to meet you. I tell you what, you're looking good. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I mean, I would be a complete wreck. I'd have to be wheeled in here today um, for this. So what time will you start running today? Um, so I'll leave here um, and pretty much start running straight away. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm just going to do some loops of London City. Today I finished running the Thames Path yesterday, so I started out at Porter's Head about 10 days ago yeah. um, and ran the Thames Path about like, 200 miles. Um, and here I am today, finished it yesterday, and today is now just a little bit of a run around. And you don't need a lie down today or anything? I absolutely need a lie down. <laughs> <You see? laughs> the reason, thanks for the compliment, looking good. I think that's your um, makeup team yeah. out the back because I, I am, yeah, I'm pretty tired. You're pretty tired. Mm -hmm. So, Tim, talk us about your, your journey because this is absolutely extraordinary. So, you were morbidly obese, is that correct? And yeah. now, you're, now you're very, very slim, and that's all down to great art of running. To, move, to movement, um, mm. basically, yeah. I, as a kid, I probably let myself go, early 20s. Um, didn't really look after myself, made some pretty poor decisions around my health and fitness and then just decided to make a change. Started moving and haven't really stopped. And, yeah, in the 3rd of December, I started... My uh, birthday. Your birthday? Yeah. I thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> That's why. So the 3rd of December, I left uh, Brisbane, my hometown in Australia. Um, and since then, I've, I've run the length of New Zealand. I've run across the United States run across South America. Uh, and, uh, immense though this is, it's to prove what the message is what. How important movement is. Um, it 
changed my life, it saved my life. And then it changed my life. Um, and I just want everyone, you know, the more people I, could, I can touch, the more people can see it, the more people can see what movement does. You know, we spend, our, our health system spend so much money on rehab. My focus is on, well, let's prevent that. Let's, uh, let's get people moving. And there's so many benefits of moving, not just physical, but emotional and mental health wise as well. So my message is just, just move, just get out, whatever it is, just move. But Tim, there'll be people watching and listening to you this morning saying, this is amazing, but this is also bonkers. I mean, there's moving and then there's running all the way around the world. Well, why, that, why go that far, quite literally? Yeah, that, that's true. And, and it's funny because one of my whole premises is sustainability. Mm. So I don't just go and, and do something silly and get injured or, or break down. Um, but I met a gentleman back from back home in 2017 that had run around the world, and I was like, that's something that I'd love to do, go see the world, wow. combine, travel well, and What have running. you seen in the world? It's all right saying... That's what I was... <laughs> <laughs> Telepathic. <laughs> <Yeah>. Telepathic. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, what, what, what is there in the world? People would say to me, what's on your bucket list or what would you yeah. want to see in the world? What, what, what have you seen that you think, wow? Um, I'd sort of break it into two categories. The first category is obviously geographic locations. Um, and I've always wanted to see Patagonia, like South America and the Andes. And my run actually took me Gosh. up and over the Andes. Is the altitude not affecting your breathing then running when you're running there? Uh, it probably did, but I didn't feel it. Not to a well point done. where well I was, yeah, yeah. I was um, like struggling mm -hmm. to move. Um, that was amazing. And I must say, and I know I'm on a... Uh, English TV show now, but the Thames path was unbelievable. See, I wouldn't, oh. e I wouldn't even know. Yeah, you work well. here and you don't. There's so much you don't see or do. And you that's what, that, that's the same with me back home in Australia. There's so much that I haven't seen that yeah. tourists come and see, and I think what's in our own backyard. But listen, was... I'm a tourist, right? So uh, about three years ago, I was in Brisbane, and I was up for uh, to report on the uh, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here jungle thing, oh, which, right. is, yep. which is north of Brisbane, right? And um, going up the motorway, I swear, I have never seen so many fast food outlets. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's something you notice or not, and, and it's a plague that's taken over the whole world and we get delivery services to home and whatever. And you talk about in your 20s, letting yourself go. So often people let themselves go and they can't get themselves back. And I look at that temptation, that fast food, that awfulness, just every, it, was, it was incredible. I've never seen a density of fast food outlets like it in my life on your motorway. You may, you may not notice, but I, I just, could, just couldn't believe it. Anyway, getting your life back, mm -hmm. literally, you, 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 you feel your eating habits have changed or what, what most of all, just moving, just moving, oh, you every, the everything, same? Everything changed because I don't think, I don't think, you can make, you've got to make a holistic change. I don't think you can just change one part and keep everything else and stay healthy. So everything changed. And I think one, one change, the movement change, led to me wanting to make other parts of my life mm. better. Because without doing that, I'm not going to improve. Mm. So. Tim, what's been the most challenging part of this for you? Because it can't have all been easy in beautiful places and, and meeting beautiful people. It must be really tough out there. I was going to ask that question. Well, we're very <laughs> in sync. Oh, um, very it has been brutal. I've had <laughs> some, some really tough days physically. Uh, I got some, some injuries sort of 70, 80 days in, um, which, which hurt just on my, my lower legs. But then, unfortunately, um, about three months ago, my father passed away. Oh, um, sorry. sorry to hear with, that. No, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, he just got, he got uh, terminal illness came on and yeah. just rolled through him really quickly. So that, that was us. I completely yeah, it was a motivation a as well. Home. Yeah, absolutely. You turned a negative into a positive yeah, for and you. He, I got home and I got a chance to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank um, you. And he just said, get back and finish that damned run. Oh. So, I, um, so here I, we are. I used to be a cross country runner and I really enjoyed running. Um, anyway, not to this excuse because then 40 years elapsed and you don't do anything sort of thing. But um, I had dis got disc problems last year in my back, uh, which I haven't recovered from. And I can't run, I can't walk, I can't do anything mm -hmm. except watch TV and eat. And, um, and it's not good. It's not a good recipe, I have to say. You're a motivation uh, with all of this. Mm -hmm. What would you say to people out there who just have not got that motivation you know what that feels like what would you say to them yeah that's a great question because even if you are motivated motivation doesn't last forever can't cannot cannot last forever 
but routine does, habits do. So if I'm back where I was 15, 20 years ago trying to start, it's that commitment to starting. Make that commitment to start and then build habits around it because motivation, it, motivation won't last. So you're gonna go dip and you know peaks and troughs about, yes, I'm ready, I'm pumped, I wanna do it. And other days you'll be like, I couldn't give a staff, I just wanna eat a hamburger and go back <laughs> to bed, right? That's just human nature. But if you build in habits and stick to that routine, then you can't really lose. So that, you're, you're, yeah. gonna, you're gonna run for the rest of your life, aren't you? Oh, 100%, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I love it. I, and you spoke about like the beautiful people I've met. That's what does it for me. I mean, the, the most amazing, generous people on this run, like they've fed me, accommodated me, you know, helped me out wherever I can. I, I had to, um, unfortunately, my crew that was with me had to, to go home. I just put a call out over the social mediums and, and I had you were 15, inundated, 20 were you? people. Right, I was gonna say to you, how do you earn a living? How do you lead a life? I don't know if you've, if you've got a partner, you've got a family or, or, or whatever, but a lot of people, what gets in their way is work, mm. really, and earning money and doing all that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I mean, it's sacrifice. Uh, so I was... And you're happier for it? Oh, I am. Yeah, the, yeah, absolutely. Because I, I mean, I'll have to go back to life. Yeah. Normal life when I get home, but... I mean, no one can take this experience no. away from me. Well, you enjoy London, my friend. Tim, lovely meeting you. An absolute privilege, yeah. and uh, you're an inspiration. You are. Thank you very and much. And where can indeed. people find you, Tim? Um, Instagram's the best place at Timmy R. Franklin. Yes. Timmy, Timmy R. Franklin. Franklin. Right, we'll just get onto that now. You're an inspiration, that. Tim. What did I do with to my meet phone? You. Yeah, lovely very to much. meet you. Yeah. Timmy R. Franklin. Right, you do the next we'll bit while you. I get <laughs> while I get Timmy R. Franklin on this. Well, let's return to Westminster, shall we, and speak to our political editor Christopher Hope, who's been speaking to the Education Secretary Gillian Keegan on these crumbling schools. Well, good morning to you again, Chris. And what did Gillian Keegan have to say? Well, she said that there will be a list published very soon, and of course, the government is chopping. Mic's off. Can you hear me now? You. Okay, sorry about that. There's been technical issues. Gillian King was saying there that they will publish a list as soon as they can of the, the schools affected. That They're delaying it because they're trying to make sure they get to the schools first, make sure they've told parents. Labour's trying to push the pace and they'll try and do a vote on Wednesday, we think, to try and force the government to release a list of the 150 or so schools affected by this RAC uh, issue. But there's more than that, I'm afraid, Eamon. Um, it goes up to 1,500 more yet to, yet to report back on the, the condition of, the, of their concrete. And when that comes back, this number could grow and grow. But we're not anywhere near the end of this issue. No, of course we're not. But you, but you know what, Chris? Um, she'll speak in, in the House today. We'll be interested to see what she says. But you say we're not anywhere near the end of it. What I want to know is, when did it begin? Mm. She's not in that job a year. When yeah. she arrived in her office, her newly refurbished office, um, did anybody say, Minister, <laughs> Secretary of State, top of the list, we've got to tell you, uh, there's 170 schools that are going to fall down in Britain if we don't do something about them. When, I wonder when she was told. Did you find that out? Well, she said they, 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 they were aware of it. They, they sent out questionnaires in April last year, and they've got back a lot of, a lot of them this summer. And then it was brought into sharp focus when there was a collapse in the school. I think it was in Kent, and that meant that the government had to act suddenly. Because I guess in all of government, you have things, uh, there's always things that might happen at any point, and you're trying to work out when you have to take action or not take action. The Tories are saying to me today that these issues have been going since the 90s, 97, 99, 2002, 2007. There were warnings to the Labour government. Of course, then the Tories came in. They cut the schools programme in, in 2010. And then, of course, 2021, Rishi Sunak as Chancellor, uh, according to a, a senior uh, education department uh, official today, he cut spending on making some of these schools um, uh, safe from safety critical fears. So throughout over the past 30 years, there have been politicians of all stripes avoiding this issue. But I think the chickens have come home to roost this summer with these questionnaires coming back that say, 1,500 are still to go, and often the delay is called, but caused by schools not filling them in, academies. But I think the focus right now uh, in Westminster today is about getting these questionnaires back in, getting an idea on the scale of the problem and dealing with it. But of course, there's always competing demands on spending money, and that's why it's only when it becomes a big critical issue that money is spent properly. 
Chris, thank you. You've got the interview. We look forward to seeing that all day here on GB News. Appreciate that. Uh, we're going to be speaking to Labour. Get Labour's reaction after this short break. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Hi, I'm Dan Wooten. You can watch me live on GB News Monday to Thursday from 9pm. And did you know that you can also watch and listen live on our website, gbnews.com. You'll always be up to date on the latest breaking news, as well as enjoying the best stories, opinions and shows. You can even join the debate under our live player as you're watching. So head straight to gbnews.com on TV, radio and online. GB News, Britain's news channel. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. We are just getting, obviously, a lot of political reaction as Westminster wakes up today. Uh, Fangam Debonair is the shadow leader of the House of Commons. We're delighted to welcome her on this, the day the Labour Party is set for a, a reshuffle today. Fangam, good morning to you in a busy day. Good morning. To, to, it's back to school for you, yes. but hardly back to school for a lot of people in the country. And I just want to say, can you guys in the Labour Party, can you hold your hands up and say, we are without sin? on this concrete situation? Absolutely. When the Tory government in, uh, ended in 1997 and the Labour government took over, we put in place the Building Schools for the Future programme. And that's because we knew that there were 10,000 buildings that had been built before 1941 who were going to come to the end of their design life by 2020, and a further 14,000 that were built in the 60s, 70s and 80s that also needed to be refurbed, rebuilt or replaced by 2020. Now, the Tories then came in in 2010 with their Lib Dem partners and cancelled that programme, since which time we have seen a 
process of managed decline by successive Tory governments failing to get a grip on this problem, lurching from crisis to crisis. And we come then to the last few years in which Rishi Sunak, then Chancellor, halved the amount of building maintenance budget in 2020. Yeah. We've had a failure of gross extent to get a grip of the problem. Since then, in 2018, part of a school building collapsed because of the reinforced concrete. That is five years ago. But now, th even th this year, I, I, I in know, May, the know... Labour Party pushed them to reveal the schools that were a problem. But the figures Sorry, you mention are immense. They're absolutely immoral as well. Yes. But are you saying that the yes. Conservative government or the coalition government actually knew that there was a danger that some of these schools could disintegrate, fall down, come apart, whatever? If they want to pretend that they didn't think it was a good idea, that they thought it was a good idea to cut school maintenance, that's on them. School rebuilding, school refurbing and school maintenance are absolutely critical. Building experts are there to advise government. The government has the resources of the civil service and building experts to call on. They were warned in practical, real terms when a, beam, when a part of a school roof collapsed in 2018 in Kent. They've been warned by successive government reports. The National Audit Office has reported even this summer they could have come clean even this summer about the extent of the damage but what we've got instead is on a day when children should be excited and looking forward to getting back to school and learning we've got children who will have got dressed today put on their school uniform got their packed lunch and then not been able to go to school now on the top of the last three years that children have had I think that's a disgrace because children learning is the single best way we make our country's future better but it's also morally important there is a moral imperative that we do the very best we can for our children that's why the last Labour government had the building school for the future programme and that's why the next Labour government will be investing and putting money into our state schools to make sure that we have the best possible start in life for our children. Well, I, I know you've got a reshuffle to announce uh, what may be the next Labour government. Um, I'm very sorry, but we are out of time on our programme to talk to you about that um, today. But obviously, as you can understand, we needed to get your reaction to this, the big news story of the day. So, uh, Shadow Leader, really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Well, Eamon will be back from 6am tomorrow morning. We are back together on Thursday morning. We are. But up next is Britain's Newsroom with Andrew and Beth. This September, the GB News family is back together from breakfast right across the day, breaking the latest stories and every evening. And don't forget the weekend. We've got the whole of the UK covered. Every week, we'll be hearing your views from up and down the country with fun, lively and intelligent conversation with the biggest guests. This September, we'll meet Chris and John. Thank you for choosing GB News. We're proud to be Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about